Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? According to, to the computer started. Thank you. Recording. Be going to the cloud. All set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And will Sergeant Bianda please start with his opening statement? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification? Once again, if all panelists could please turn on their video for verification. To minimize disruptions, we ask to please place electronic devices on silent or vibrate mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing on the City Council Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committee will conduct an oversight hearing on the progress of the Foster Youth Task Force and consider Intro 148, a bill that I sponsored to require the Department of Homeless Services to recognize time spent in foster care as quote unquote homelessness for the purpose of meeting eligibility requirements for the city FEPS rental voucher. Since 2015, my office has hosted an annual foster youth shadow day where foster youth spend the day with council members. Many great legislative ideas have came out of our first shadow day, including establishing the foster youth task force which was established by Local Law 144 of 2016. The task force was comprised of advocates, youth, parents, providers of foster care services and government officials, including my office, with the intention of examining the foster care system and making recommendations for improvement. Since the release of the first task force report, the number of children in foster care has continued to drop. Those in, um, Sorry, what, but th those in care are much more likely to be with family instead of strangers, and parent engagement has been more of a priority at ACS. There have been many successes, but as we have seen from the recently released report, experience, quote, experiences and well being of sexual and gender diverse youth in foster care in New York City, close quote, there are still significant needs within the foster care system. The committee will examine what progress has been made on the task force recommendations, what gaps in service remain, and how COVID-19 has impacted these goals. Additionally, the committee will in, uh, consider intro 148, which will ensure that foster youth leaving care have access to city fest rental vouchers. In 2018, 23 youth who aged out of foster care ended up in the DHS system, in the DHS shelter within one year of aging out. This is absolutely unacceptable. These are youth that were in the city's care and the city needs to ensure that these teens and young adults have a permanent home. We also know that young adults are more likely to couch surf rather than end up in the city's shelter system. Now, although they are not formally considered homeless and are not included in much of the data, these young adults are not in stable housing. They are not on a lease, they have no rights, and are completely dependent on the whims of the friends that they stay with. I understand under the city FEPS rules that ACS can and has referred foster youth to DSS for a city FEPS voucher. And while I'm grateful that a process exists for foster youth to obtain a voucher, a current or former foster youth should not have to rely on a bureaucratic system to submit a referral to yet another bureaucratic system. We need to ensure that the young adults leaving the ACS system have the autonomy to apply for a voucher themselves, to look for an apartment themselves, and to control their own destiny. While New York City is in a challenging financial crisis, we need to decide what our priorities are and what we stand for as a city. In December 2019, ACS launched the Fair Futures Initiative, 
aimed at enhancing and improving outcomes for foster care youth ages 11 to 21 in the areas of education, employment, housing, and permanency. Despite unprecedented challenges due to a $9 billion revenue shortfall from the COVID-19 pandemic, the council was successful in preserving this initiative in the fiscal 21 budget. I appreciate the efforts by my colleagues to join in the fight to maintain this funding and am hopeful that we can continue to weave a more robust social safety net, especially during difficult times. I wanna thank the advocates and members of the public for joining us today. I wanna to thank representatives of the administration for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that have joined this hearing, Councilmember Bob Holden, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik. Um, I don't think I see any others at the moment, but we certainly expect more members of the committee to be joining us throughout the hearing. Um, I wanna thank my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, Elizabeth Adams, my legislative director, and my committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, and Natalie Omari, policy analyst. Um, I wanna uh, uh, thank uh, the, the administration officials that are here today. I see Deputy Commissioner Julie Farber is here, Associate Commissioner Ina Mendez. Um, I look forward to hearing um, uh, Assistant Commissioner Ra Raymond Singleton, um, uh, Yuri Pawluk, um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Michael Moiseyev, um, and I'm not sure if we, we have any others, but I look forward to hearing from all of you this morning. And with that, I will turn it over to, oh, we've also been joined by Council Member Keith Powers as well. Um, and I see Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner at DSS and Stephanie Gendel at ACS as well here. Um, now I'll turn it back over to Council of the Committee um, uh, to, uh, to introduce the administration. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good morning, everyone. I am Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you are going to be on mute until you're called on to testify. At that point, you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelists will be. And so the first panel will be members of the administration. For the Administration for Children's Services, we have Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner. And with her for questions and answers will be Michael Moiseyev, Deputy Commissioner, Ina Mendez, Associate Commissioner, Yurij Pauluk, Associate Commissioner, Raymond Singleton, Assistant Commissioner. And for the Department of Social Services, we have Erin Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner. I'm going to call on each of you when it is your turn to speak during the hearing. If council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and Chair Levin will call on you in order. We're gonna be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. I'm now gonna call on members of the administration to testify. Before I do so, I'm going to deliver the oath of, to, to each member of the administration. So one at a time, I'll call your name and deliver the oath to you. And we'll begin with Deputy Commissioner Julie Farber. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And now Michael Moiseyev. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before <clears throat> honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Now I'll call on Ina Mendez. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Associate Commissioner. And now I will call on Yurij Pollock. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, um, I uh, do. Thank you, Associate Commissioner. Now I'll call on Raymond Singleton. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I was waiting for the unmute. <laughs> I do. Thank you. And finally, I will call on Aaron Drinkwater. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. 
And now I will turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Julie Farber. Thank you very much. Um, before I start my testimony today, um, I want to recognize the passing of Mayor David Dinkins, and we at ACS send our condolences to his family and friends and all New Yorkers in recognition of his commitment to our city. Um, Moving to my testimony. Um, good afternoon, Chair Levin and members of the City Council Committee on General Welfare. I am Julie Farber, the Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Family Permanency Services, FPS, at the New York City Administration for Children's Services. With me today are Michael Moiseyev, Deputy Commissioner of the ACS Division of Financial Services, and my colleagues in FPS, Ina Mendez, Associate Commissioner, Office of Strategic Program Support, and Yuri Pollack, Associate Commissioner, and Ray Singleton, Assistant Commissioner, both in the Office of Education and Employment Initiatives. Also with us is Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the Department of Social Services. We are extremely pleased to be here to reflect on the important and very successful work of the Interagency Foster Care Task Force and to talk about ACS's efforts to strengthen our foster care system going forward. I first want to thank Council Member and General Welfare Chair Stephen Levin for authoring the bill that created the task force. And not only did Council Member Levin author the bill, but he participated in every single task force meeting and every single subcommittee meeting of which he was a member. Um, and we're inspired um, by his uh, dedication and commitment. Um, to uh, children and families in the foster care system. The interagency task force was created following the enactment of Local Law 144 of 2016, which was signed into law by, by Mayor de Blasio on November 6, 2016. The law established the composition of the task force to include a range of perspectives, experience, and expertise. The task force was chaired by the commissioner of the Administration for Children's Services, and its designated members, um, importantly, included youth currently and previously in foster care, parents, advocates, representatives from foster care agencies, the public advocate, the speaker of the city council, the chair of the general welfare Welfare Committee, the commissioners of DSS, DYCD, DOHMH, the chancellor of DOE, and the chair of the New York City Housing Authority. The legislation charged the task force with issuing recommendations to improve services and outcomes for youth both in and aging out of foster care. In addition to issuing a report on the recommendations, the task force was required to produce two follow-up reports on the implementation of the recommendations, at which time the law sunset. The task force initial report was released in March 2018 and included 16 very strong and valuable recommendations to improve services and outcomes for youth in and aging out of foster care. All of those recommendations were incorporated into ACS's foster care strategic blueprint, which guides our work. ACS issued the one-year progress report uh, from the task force in March 2019, and we issued the final two-year progress report in March of this year, March 2020. Our sister agencies in city government, parents, youth, advocates, and provider agencies have truly been incredible partners with ACS in implementing the recommendations. I am extremely grateful for the shared expertise and collaboration that has really been instrumental in moving this work forward. While the task force concluded its work following the submission of the third and final report in March, we appreciate the opportunity today to highlight the many, many accomplishments of the task force um, and to discuss the ways that we are further advancing its recommendations. Uh, 
So specifically today, I'm going to focus on the progress that we've made in all three domains that the task force covered. The first is improving permanency outcomes. The second is improving health, mental health, and education services for children in foster care. And the third is improving prospects for young adults who are leaving the foster care system. As you will hear, we have continued to focus our efforts on ensuring that children and youth in foster care and their families have what they need to flourish, even as we continue to adapt our work to address health and safety throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to first speak to our critically important work around improving permanency outcomes. Permanency is a top priority and the task force made several recommendations designed to reduce the time that children spend in foster care. Our mission across all of ACS is to promote child safety while supporting and strengthening families. It's hard to imagine that there were nearly 50,000 New York City children in foster care 25 years ago and 17,000 children just a decade ago. Today, we have under 8,000 children in foster care as a result of investments that we have made in our nationally recognized continuum of prevention services that are highly effective in keeping New York City children safe and supported at home with their families. Through our ongoing efforts in New York City, temporary foster care placement is an increasingly rare intervention and it is used only as a last resort when there are no alternate plans available to keep children at home safely. It's important to note that we've also made significant progress reducing the time that children spend in foster care when they do have to enter care. Chapin Hall, an independent national child welfare expert, conducted an evaluation of our Title IV-E federal waiver program and found that through the waiver implement, uh, interventions that we implemented, such as reducing foster care caseloads and increasing therapeutic supports for parents of young children, we reduced length, median length of stay in foster care by 9%, an average of 50 days per child, a concrete result and reduction in length of stay in foster care. And despite the federal waiver ending, ACS has maintained these key components of the waiver initiatives through federal transition funds. Now, ACS contracts with and oversees 26 nonprofit foster care agencies that provide foster care services for New York City children and their families. That partnership is critical. Those agencies are working every single day to support the needs of children, parents, and foster parents. For those children for whom foster care is a necessary safety intervention, our goal is to reunify children with their families as soon as possible. Reunification is the permanency outcome for the vast majority of children who enter foster care. We know that children fare best with their families. When reunification is not safely possible, ACS and our providers work to achieve permanent families for children through adoption or through kinship guardianship. One key area addressed by the task force was enhancing our practices to increase placing children with kinship resources, such as relatives or family friends, whenever children need to come into foster care. National research shows that children in foster care fare best when they're placed with a kinship resource. This can help reduce trauma, preserve community connections, increase placement stability, and improve emotional well-being. It also increases the overall likelihood of achieving permanency and reduces the risk of re-entry into foster care after exiting. During the last three years, and we are very proud of this achievement, ACS has successfully increased the proportion of children in foster care placed with kin from 31% to 41%. 
And even during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen this percentage increase further uh, and it has uh, inched up all the way to 41.6% at this point. We've achieved this important increase through a range of strategies across the system. We created dedicated kinship specialists in our Division of Child Protection, and they are focused on finding and engaging kinship caregivers for children when they're first entering foster care. So children don't have to spend even one night um, with a stranger. We also lost, uh, launched a find family and friends first campaign with training and education materials to help our frontline child protective staff prioritize this important effort. And there are posters and flyers and materials um, throughout all of the Division of Child Protection offices that uh, continue to reinforce this campaign and this message. With an FY 2020 investment from the city, we procured Binti, a software that will make the foster home certification process digital. And this is one of many steps that ACS has taken over the last four years uh, to increase and leverage technology to provide better services for children and families. The Binti software will make foster parent certification and recertification more user friendly and will reduce paperwork for foster parents as well as for foster care agency staff. Binti has been working with our foster care providers to, customi to customize the forms and the workflows for each agency. And we're implementing a phased pilot starting with nine agencies this winter. In the coming months, we are extremely excited to make the online applicant portal available to uh, prospective foster parents and then current foster parents who are recertifying and then enabling all of our foster care agencies to use the Binti software to enhance the tracking and certification and foster parent recruitment and support processes. Supported by city investments in FY19 and FY20, we were also able to provide four foster care agencies with funding to launch pilots aimed at increasing kinship placements. And this has been one piece of our overall um, range of strategies to increase kinship placement. These agencies implemented a range of strategies, including kinship caregivers and staff in joint trainings, hosting virtual support groups for kinship caregivers, collaborating with city MD to make the medical clearance process easier, and having dedicated staff to support kinship caregivers. Since the pilots have ended, we have been sure to share the lessons learned across all of our foster care agencies so that we can incorporate the successful strategies into practice system wide. The task force also identified increasing the quality and quantity of family time, which is also known as visiting, um, and refers to the time that children in foster care and their parents spend together. This is a key strategy to improving permanency outcomes. We know that the quality and quantity of family time is a direct predictor of a successful family reunification. So we've taken a number of steps in this area, including implementing two new tools with foster care agencies to help encourage positive experiences during family time and to aid decision making around child safety and the progression of visits, all with the goal of achieving more timely and safe reunifications. The first tool helps agencies assess families' readiness to move from supervised to unsupervised visits. The second tool is a family time space assessment tool to help foster care agencies evaluate and improve the quality of their visiting areas so that they are family friendly and really create the kind of space that supports uh, families uh, and children's interactions. 
prior to the pandemic, ACS expanded its visiting program at Rikers Island, and we released a video that we made in conjunction with the Osborne Association to promote family time for children of incarcerated parents. To improve family time for children with parents living in shelter, in May 2018, we issued and implemented guidance to the foster care agencies regarding appropriate alternative visiting locations with instructions for how to request ACS approval and payment for when parents lack appropriate housing to have overnight visits with their children. Supported by city investments in FY19 and FY20, ACS and four foster care agencies piloted additional family time improvement strategies, including visit coaching, case aids accompanying uh, families on visits outside the agency, identifying offsite visiting spaces where you can have more natural interaction, providing kits with supplies to encourage and support family positive, positive family interactions, and like here again, as with the kin pilots, we've gathered the takeaways from these family time pilots and have shared those across all of the foster care agencies. And some of the additional strategies that are being spread across the system include holding more visits outside agency walls, utilizing supervision by kinship resources, dedicating staff who are focused on coordinating visits right from the moment a foster care agency assigned a new case, providing food and coordinating activities as a way to encourage high quality visits and positive interactions between parents and foster parents and parents and their children, and using technology to include parents in every day activities such as bedtime stories, offering visit coaching to help families overcome obstacles to reunification, and facilitating virtual parenting skill building and support groups. Our work with the task force has contributed also to stronger relationships with parent advocacy organizations and additional strategies to enhance parent voice throughout ACS programs, planning, and policy. We created the new role of parent engagement specialist at ACS in 2019 to increase the voice of parents with lived experiences in all aspects of ACS's work. Our parent engagement specialist, Sabra Jackson, supports the Parent Advisory Council, otherwise known as the PAC, which regularly meets, shares recommendations, and engages in difficult and challenging conversations with ACS leadership, including Commissioner Hansel, myself, and others, to hold us accountable and to strengthen our work with families. We also have collaborated with RISE, the parent advocacy organization, to develop tools and resources to support quality family time and to create a training curriculum for foster care agencies to focus on strengthening relationships between parents and foster parents. This helps all of the adults in a child's life work together to provide a safe and stable environment and move more quickly towards permanency. Parents with lived experience in the child welfare system have been generous and forthright in sharing their stories with ACS and calling us to action to continually improve our support for other parents. And we are truly grateful for their leadership. With input from parents, parent advocates, legal advocates, and other key stakeholders, ACS is currently updating two documents. The first is the Parent's Guide to Child Protective Services, and the second is the Handbook for Parents with Children in Foster Care. While the finalization of these documents was temporarily delayed, we will soon be sharing the documents with the PAC, the Parent Advisory Council, for their feedback, and we plan to finalize and issue these documents as soon as possible. We remain committed to ensuring that parents receive relevant and informative materials to help them understand what to expect during an investigation 
and when a child is placed in foster care, and the ways to access more help and support and advocacy throughout their involvement with ACS or foster care. The task force permanency initiatives are incorporated into the ongoing priorities that we at ACS are aggressively implementing through our foster care strategic blueprint. Through our home away from home initiative, we remain focused on efforts to increase kinship placement, foster home recruitment, and supports for foster parents. We are continuing our focus on kinship care and we have implemented a range of strategies that successfully increased new foster parent recruitment by 50% from FY17 to FY19. We achieved this by focusing on strategies that leverage current foster parents as credible messengers to recruit other foster parents. We've also built better supports for kinship and non-kinship foster parents, including a focus on connecting foster parents to one another as key peer supports. ACS continues to provide data and intensive technical assistance to the foster care agencies to help them analyze and enhance their business processes and to implement best practices to improve kinship placement as well as foster parent recruitment and support. Parent voice remains at the forefront of our activities, and we recently announced an extremely exciting and very important new parent advocate initiative called Parents Supporting Parents. The purpose of this initiative is to improve reunification and race equity outcomes. In the initial pilot, Two foster care agencies, Graham and Rising Ground, will be staffed with nine parent advocates who have lived experience, personal experience of their own with the child welfare system. And they will receive intensive training and support and technical assistance from RISE. They will become central members of the case planning team, the foster care case planning team at those two agencies, and they will be working with parents to help achieve reunification. These parent advocates will be crucial allies to empower parents and help dismantle bias in the foster care system by bringing their lived experience to strengthen parent self-advocacy and voice within the process and also helping ACS and our foster care provider agency partners shift organizational culture to more authentic parent engagement approaches. We raised funds uh, from major national and local foundations to launch this pilot, and we hope that it will lay the groundwork for full implementation, which would mean having a parent advocate assigned to every parent with a goal of reunification across the foster care system. Now I'd like to switch gears and turn to the second area of focus um, for the task force, which was around improving health, mental health, and education services for children in foster care. Seven of the task force recommendations were designed to improve the well being and educational attainment of children while in care. Research consistently shows that children in care are at a significant educational disadvantage. They may enter care already behind in schooling. They may experience higher school absence rates, have a greater likelihood of trauma induced behavioral challenges, and they may face difficulty developing and sustaining supportive relationships with teachers and counselors, which is a key ingredient um, in resilience and overall well being. Youth in foster care have also, of course, experienced trauma that can affect their physical and mental health, leading to further challenges such as placement instability or difficulty in school. Children in foster care and the families supporting them need ready access to a variety of trauma-informed healthcare services in order to achieve more positive outcomes. 
ACS and our partners have implemented the task force's recommendations in this area, focusing on core educational, health, and mental health needs of youth and care, and resulting in an enhanced array of services and as well as coordination among service providers and our sister agencies to benefit young people in foster care. Thanks to these coordinated efforts among child welfare and other nonprofit agencies, foundations, advocates, and inspirational young people who comprise the Fair Futures Coalition, and with dedicated support from Chair Levin to urge the city's investments, we successfully launched Fair Futures, a combination of two task force recommendations to improve education, employment, housing, and permanency outcomes for youth in foster care by providing youth with coaches, tutors, and other supports. I want to specifically acknowledge, and I know she's on here to testify, Erica Francois and the Fair Futures Youth Board, who have done absolutely tremendous work to promote the importance of these services and to share with all of us the significance um, and importance of these services to their experience in foster care and to the young people coming up behind them. And so I just wanna say kudos to Erica and the Fair Futures Youth Board. New York City is the first jurisdiction in the nation to implement an initiative for youth in foster care of this breadth and scale which provides dedicated coaches, tutors, education specialists, employment specialists, housing specialists who work with youth in foster care ages 11 to 21 to help them achieve their academic and career goals. The initiative started as a seven month pilot in FY20 and for FY21, ACS received a $2.7 million investment at budget adoption with state matching funds, as well as one-time additional revenue in the ACS budget, ACS has been able to provide $12 million in total to the foster care providers to continue Fair Futures this fiscal year. Through Fair Futures, our goal is to help youth prepare for major transitions, including the transitions between elementary school, middle school, and high school, as well as the transition from high school to college, vocational training, and or a fulfilling career. Thousands of young people are receiving tutoring, coaching, educational advocacy, connections to employment, and more. Most importantly, through Fair Futures, we support young people in the achievement of the key milestones that put them on a path to success after they leave foster care to permanency or to independent living. We are thrilled to hear from young people who are finding the program beneficial as they receive support and build confidence and lifelong skills to become strong advocates for themselves and their needs. The task force identified at educational outcomes as critical to the well being and future success of children and youth in foster care. As recommended by the task force, the New York City DOE released comprehensive guidance on the rights of students in foster care. They created a website page on foster care and added it to its online resource hub. DOE also hired 100 community based, school based community coordinators to connect young people people, including students in foster care, to a range of supportive services. Youth in foster care with attendance challenges benefit from access to DOE success mentors who are caring adults who identify the underlying causes of chronic student absenteeism and address barriers to attendance that ensure that students can reach their full academic uh, potential. ACS regularly works with the DOE to navigate individual educational challenges and to help children in foster care establish and maintain strong educational connections and supports. Prior to the pandemic, the task force collaboration led to an increase in the number of middle school children in foster care who were enrolled in DYCD's after school programs. 
With the pandemic, ACS has been collaborating with both DUICD and DOE to ensure that children in foster care who are in need of support on days that they are learning remotely are enrolled in Learning Bridges. The task force is also focused on health and mental health, and we've made significant progress in strengthening the health and mental health supports for children and youth in foster care. We worked across city and state systems to enhance access to programs like the Nurse Family Partnership for Youth Who Are First-Time Parents, it's a home visiting program. Uh, we've worked on the home and community-based waiver services for youth who are transitioning out of care, who have significant physical or mental health needs or developmental disabilities, and we've worked on increasing utilization of crisis and behavioral health support services through the ongoing state Medicaid redesign. This refers to the CFTSS services, which stands for Children and Family Treatment Support Services, which is a new range of services available through Medicaid. We continue to collaborate our partners and refer youth in foster care to these important programs. Children and youth in foster care also continue to benefit from trauma-informed mental health supports that ACS originally implemented as part of our federal Title IV-E waiver. This includes our efforts to improve foster children's access to appropriate evidence-based mental health interventions and improving communication and collaborative treatment planning between child welfare and mental health services. We have also expanded the ABC program, Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up, which is an evidence-based intervention uh, that um, helps new parents and foster parents practice nurturing, responsive caregiving behaviors that promote healthy development and improved attachment for infants and toddlers. One key area of progress that the task force has advanced and that we are very pleased to highlight and we know is of interest to the council is in accessing the New York State Office of Mental Health web-based application called Psyches, which stands for Psychiatric Services and Clinical Knowledge Enhancement System. This is an important system that provides Medicaid data regarding the health and behavioral diagnoses and treatments for um, Medicaid recipients, including uh, children in foster care. By providing ACS now with access to this system, it will enhance quality improvement, case planning, and clinical decision-making for individuals receiving behavioral health services through Medicaid, including children in foster care who are receiving these services. After intensive coordination and a lot of work with state OMH and OCFS to ensure that all of the legal requirements pertaining to uh, health information sharing and confidentiality are met, and that we had strong data privacy procedures in place, I am pleased to share that ACS now has access to individual child level information from Psyches. We are now working to build out internal capacity to implement access to the individual child level information for the clinical, medical, and nursing staff in our health and mental health offices who work directly with and or support for youth and or support care for youth in foster care. And then the next step is working together with OMH, do it and our IT and analytic team to produce aggregate data reports, which we anticipate will be completed this winter. Now shifting to the third area, I wanna talk about the task force work and our work moving forward around improving prospects for young adults leaving foster care. While as I said earlier, most children and youth in foster care return home or they're adopted or they achieve permanency through kinship guardianship. However, in calendar year 2019, approximately 600 young people transitioned from foster care to independent living. 
we are committed to providing older youth in care with the necessary services and supports to acquire the skills to live a healthy, productive, and self-sufficient adult life. And we welcomed the task force's focus on this really tremendously important goal. Housing stability for youth leaving care is a top priority for ACS. And it is one that the task force focused on and where substantial progress was made. I wanna clarify that ACS does not and will not discharge any youth from foster care if they do not have a safe and stable living arrangement in place. This was the case prior to COVID and it remains the case now. Even once a youth reaches the age of 21, which is the legal age limit for foster care reimbursement uh, in New York State and nationally, ACS has an established procedure to provide continued care and support through city funds for foster youth and maintain them in their current foster care placement when needed. So in other words, young people do not exit care at 21 if they do not have stable housing. We keep them in their foster care placement supported with city funds until we're able to identify stable housing for them. The task force made significant strides to increasing overall housing access for foster youth with a work group focused on expanding access to key housing resources. And we achieved concrete progress in this area. And I'll run through a few of those. As I previously discussed, uh, we're thrilled to launch Fair Futures and that includes uh, helping young people prepare for important life transitions, and it includes additional housing search supports. We also worked with our partners at NYCHA to ensure that all ACS referred youth are receiving the highest housing priority, which is known as the N0 priority. Regardless of whether the youth resided in a foster home or residential facility within the five boroughs, a neighboring county, or was attending college outside of New York City. The task force also recommended city advocacy to increasing the housing assistance that is provided to foster youth and child welfare involved families at the state level. And ACS did join the advocacy effort that led to the enactment of a state law change regarding the child welfare housing subsidy. This legislative change makes it clear that the housing subsidy can be used in living arrangements where the beneficiary has roommates, as many youth and families do. So previously there wasn't clarity and this legislation has now provided that clarity that this can be used in roommate situations. Additionally, we partnered with uh, HPD to secure federal housing choice vouchers through the Family Unification Program, otherwise known as FUP. To sue, uh, and to date, 85 of these vouchers have been awarded. Through the city's 1515 Supportive Housing Initiative, ACS is also able to refer single youth and pregnant or parenting young adults to this critical supportive housing resource. The task force also focused on supporting youth to achieve their employment and post-secondary employment goals. This work is centralized within ACS's Office of Education and Employment Initiatives, and which is head by Associate Commissioner Yuri Pollack and Assistant Commissioner Raymond Singleton, who are joining me today. And that work is not only continuing during this difficult time, um, but if anything, accelerating. The office regularly partners with DYCD to connect youth with the Advance and Earn Paid Internship Program, as well as available summer youth employment program opportunities. This past summer, several hundred older and younger youth in foster care participated in the SYEP Summer Bridge, a career exploration and skill building program sponsored by DYCD.
to help address the need to connect youth with jobs in light of the pandemic, ACS held its first ever virtual youth career fair in spring 2020, which connected more than 100 youth with paid employment opportunities. We had some great companies um, that joined us for the career fair. ACS also leverages public-private partnerships to support hundreds of youth in foster care to achieve their education and workforce goals. In addition to all of the work that I've described in the context of Fair Futures, we have launched numerous initiatives, including the Life Set Program in, park, in partnership with New Yorkers for Children and Youth Villages that promote successful transitions to adulthood, we have a mentored internship program that has served nearly 400 young people across 12 foster care agencies, and that's in partnership with the Pinkerton Foundation. We've implemented the YA Work Program, which stands for Young Adult Work Opportunities for Rewarding Careers. That's a model that we've implemented across 10 foster care agencies, and that is supported by Lauren Gates at the Workplace Center at Columbia University. And we were thrilled this summer, in addition to all of that, to deliver a virtual summer internship program for 100 young people through a grant from the Robin Hood Foundation in partnership with New Yorkers for Children this summer. During that six week program, which was conducted entirely online, youth gained valuable work experience by being paired with supervisors from ACS, New Yorkers for Children and foster care agencies. Participants benefited from skills training, educational workshops, other career related activities. Support from the Robin Hood Foundation likewise enabled ACS for the first time, given the incredible success of the summer internship program, Robin Hood and ACS launched a fall internship program and uh, also for 100 young people. And this was just launched last month. This program is providing work experience, training and career related activities. This fall internship program is targeted towards young people in foster care who are in college, as well as young people who are opportunity youth um, or disconnected youth who are neither employed nor attending school. The program includes supports for youth to enhance literacy skills and obtain their HSE diplomas. I also want to touch on the Fostering College Success Initiative, uh, which is also known as the DORM Project, which ACS established in partnership with CUNY and the New York Foundling. This program is continuing to operate, continuing to provide year-round financial, academic, and socio-emotional support for youth in foster care who are in college. Now, at the height of COVID, when CUNY announced that all dorms other than Queens College would be closing in March 2020 due to the pandemic, ACS worked very closely with the foster care agencies and the students themselves to safely house all students who needed to relocate. During this challenging time, we continued to support youth including by continuing to provide stipends, tutoring, career counseling, coaching, and other supports. Recently, uh, we had some very exciting news from CUNY when CUNY informed ACS that a new dorm at Hunter College would be made available to youth in foster care. In addition, CUNY made additional slots available at the existing Queens College dorm. As such, there are now enough dorm rooms available for all of the dorm project students who were displaced during the pandemic, as well as additional uh, dorm beds available for new students joining the program. Through workshops, individualized coaching sessions, tutoring and career advising, New York Foundling is ensuring that students remain engaged and committed to their academic success, even during the pandemic and especially during the pandemic. Students are studying, they're meeting with advisors, they're assessing their current course load, they're thinking about registering for the spring semester, and the program has added a career counseling 
service this fall for the first time. Through a dedicated team of career counselors, the FCSI, Fostering College Success Initiative, the FCSI students receive one-on-one -on -one career counseling as well as participate in career development workshops. Now I'd like to turn um, to talking about the support that we have been providing to children and families during the pandemic since March. As the task force concluded its work in March 2020, we all simultaneously pivoted to face an unprecedented national crisis with the onset of the COVID pandemic. The foundations we established and the core values that we collectively embraced through the task force have been especially critical as ACS and our partners have worked to respond to this crisis. While the personal and professional challenges that all of us have faced have impacted our daily lives for the significant portion of this year, I am inspired by the resilience of children and families and by the frontline heroism of my colleagues at ACS, the staff at the foster care agencies and foster parents, and I'm in awe of the creativity and the dedication and caring that we have seen throughout this pandemic from all of our colleagues and partners. During this difficult time, the comfort and support of family is essential. As I mentioned, our focus on kinship has remained strong throughout the pandemic and we are continuing to press this forward. Uh, and as I mentioned, kinship has increased from 31 to 40% and has continued to increase even during the pandemic. We have continually and consistently emphasized the critical importance of visits, family time, communication between children and foster care and their parents, which are essential to support children's well being, minimizing trauma, and working towards reunification. We have issued emergency guidance. All of the guidance is on our website. This guidance instructs our foster care agencies to carefully review and weigh child safety needs and families' potential health risks when determining if contact should be held in person or virtually. Our guidance makes clear that Agencies cannot have blanket policies regarding family time and visiting, but rather these decisions must be made on a case by case basis. Our guidance specifically directs agencies and authorizes them to purchase technology for youth, families and staff to support virtual visits if this is determined to be the best option for the family. And since the pandemic be began, ACS has hosted several webinars with hundreds of foster care agency staff on how to best approach family time, whether it's in person or virtually. With the family court's limited operations during the pandemic, ACS has taken aggressive proactive steps to safely progress cases toward reunification. Early on in the pandemic, we launched a review of the cases of almost 2,000 children in foster care with a goal of reunification. The purpose of those reviews was to determine if these cases could move forward either to increased visiting, trial discharge, or final discharge back to their families. In cases that could move forward, we worked with the parent's attorney and children's attorney where necessary to sign stipulations and submitted these agreements to the court for its approval. This process has helped to move reunification cases forward, even without the court holding hearings. Given the court's continued limited operations at this time, we are currently launching yet another round of reviews of reunification cases. And our Division of Family Court Legal Services, FCLS, continues to identify cases 
that could be resolved with agreements between the parties. And then we submit these to the court for approval. Attorneys representing parents and children have also provided lists of cases to us that they think are appropriate for resolution, including release of children to the parent or allowing an excluded parent to return to the home. And we have an approach to reach resolutions whenever possible. This work, this proactive work has been extremely critical to enable families to continue to move towards and to achieve reunification during the pandemic. ACS has also worked with foster care agencies to ensure that adoption and kinship guardian cases are ready to proceed as soon as the court begins hearing these matters. We are advocating for the family court to schedule hearings in all reunification, adoption, and kinship guardianship cases. While judicial resolution of permanency issues has slowed dramatically during COVID-19, we stand ready to move these cases forward as soon as family court capacity will allow. Ensuring that youth in foster care are able to participate in remote learning is another critical priority for ACS. Starting in spring 2020, we partnered with the DOE to provide thousands of young people in foster care with remote learning devices, including children at the Children's Center and the Youth Reception Centers. With the start of the new school year, ACS has continued to work closely with DOE staff to expedite delivery for children and youth newly entering care who require devices. ACS and providers also are furnishing students with tablets and computers whenever needed while they may be waiting for arrival of their DOE devices. DOE has also issued a guidance on supporting students in temporary housing, foster care and ACS involved students with return to school, prioritizing these populations to make sure they're receiving their remote learning devices and targeting them for outreach and support from the DOE community coordinators and from the success mentors who can provide a range of assistance and supports. In addition, ACS and DOE have collaborated to enhance the capacity of foster care agency staff to support students in foster care with remote learning. We've conducted a series of trainings on how to assist families in navigating remote learning technology. We've also partnered with DOE on a series of information sessions about remote learning for both parents and for foster parents. And we've held sessions in both the spring and the fall regarding key issues for remote and hybrid learning, again, for both parents and foster parents. Children in foster care have also been prioritized to participate in Learning Bridges, New York City's child care program for children in 3K through eighth grade who, are particip who were participating in blended learning. Children who are in foster care also have access to a full continuum of medical and mental health supports, including trauma-informed services. During COVID-19, many of these services have been taking place effectively via telehealth delivery to help minimize the spread of the virus. And our foster care providers have provided technology as well as Wi-Fi plans whenever needed for youth, parents, and foster parents to access services and make sure that they're staying connected. Finally, I want to turn to um, Introduction 148, 2018. As I mentioned, stable housing for foster youth who are discharged to independent living is a key focus for ACS and an important priority for all of our partners who participated in the task force. The committee is hearing Intro 148, 2018 today, sponsored by Chair Levin. 
the bill would require the Department of Homeless Services, DHS, to recognize time spent in foster care as homelessness for the purpose of meeting rental voucher eligibility requirements. ACS and our colleagues at DHS are interested in continuing to work with the sponsor to assist young adults aging out of foster care to address their housing needs and to prevent future homelessness. We appreciate the council's dedication to our shared goal of assuring that older youth in care have access to stable housing resources. Finally, in conclusion, the Interagency Foster Care Task Force was an incredibly valuable, substantive, productive, and important partnership among key stakeholders to identify important priorities to enhance outcomes for children and youth in foster care. We are truly grateful for the dedication of our partners on the task force and we continue to work closely with all of them on a number of fronts as we talked about today, even though the task force itself has concluded. We are especially grateful to the focus of Chair Levin and the City Council to help secure resources to advance the task force recommendations. While we remain in a time of tremendous budget challenges and the ongoing pandemic, ACS is committed to a continual state of quality improvement and reform, and we will continue to aggressively implement strategies to assure that youth in foster care and their families achieve the best possible outcomes. Thank you to the Council and our other vital partners in this work, and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner Farber. Um, and I just want to um, uh, say that the, uh, the reason why the task force was so successful, um, in my opinion, was the, um, uh, the willingness of, of Commissioner Hansel and yourself and, um, and everyone else at ACS your willingness to take it on with an open mind and and um, and with you know a level of of uh, excitement and exuberance and and um, an interest in bringing people together um, and making it a very collaborative um, endeavor and having you know different voices at the table um, uh, you know making sure making sure not everybody was there um, as a rubber stamp uh, to you know just just agree with with uh, um, you know, a predetermined line. This was a, so this was a, it was a successful um, uh, model that I think, um, you know, as other future administrations and future councils look at how to collaborate, um, it, it's a good model um, for how to make a task force actually um, result in some uh, good policy changes. And obviously that was highlighted by um, the many um, the, the many uh, um, new initiatives uh, that you highlighted in your testimony that um, that have kind of come out of this this process. So uh, I want to acknowledge all the work that you've done um, with your team. It's really um, uh, pretty extraordinary. So. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, <laughs> yes. but it's but it's it's good to see. Um, I just want to also acknowledge. Um, other uh, council members that have joined us, council member Traeger, council member Rosenthal, council member Lander, council member Gibson, um, and council member Torres. Um, our, our, uh, while we still have him as council member, our, our, our congress member elect, um, if, uh, if Richie's still on the hearing, actually, if you have any federal issues that you want to address um, in the next Congress, I would suggest uh, taking this opportunity um, because Richie's going to, to Washington. So we're all very excited for him. Um, uh, so actually my first question, um, uh, speaking of federal um, uh, issues, the, 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 uh, the Title IV-E waiver, can you speak a little bit about how um, that factored into 
um, ACS's efforts uh, over the last several years. And uh, if there's, oper- you know, with an, with an incoming administration um, in Washington, uh, are there opportunities? How, how does how does that work? The waiver is that a is that a um, a discretionary action by an administration, or are there opportunities for additional funds uh, that you could see on the horizon? And maybe speak a little bit about that um, uh, that overall picture. Sure, um, and I'll speak a little bit about too. You know what we did. Um, programmatically in the waiver. And then I will turn to my colleague, Michael Moiseyev, who can speak to the sort of financial um, components of it. But essentially the, the waiver ran for about five years and we, through the waiver, uh, lowered caseloads. Um, foster care caseloads had been, you know, from 18 to 22, and we lowered them to 10 to 12. So it was very significant uh, lowering of caseloads. And then we implemented a couple of um, evidence-based models, which I referenced in my testimony: attachment, biobehavioral catch-up, and partnering for success, which was focused around essentially improving mental health services and access and coordination, and improving. Um, trauma and attachment for young children. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, those um, that, that uh, initiative was highly successful in um, reducing length of stay and improving um, certain child well-being outcomes. So the, um, the 4E waiver ended, um, and then there has been uh, federal transition money um, that is currently funding the work. Um, and so I'll, I'll turn to my colleague, Michael Moiseyev, who can and add a little bit to that. Thank you so much, Deputy Farber, and uh, thank you, Chair, for your question. Um, uh, yes, the uh, the waiver was in law; it was statutory. Um, we uh, did get uh, some transition money to bridge over since the waiver ended. Uh, that just takes us through the end of this year. Uh, we are very much looking forward to working with the incoming Biden administration and the incoming Congress. And look, look forward to your support. Great. And um, as there, I mean, have there been discussions um, in Washington about reestablishing um, the waiver moving forward, or is that something that happens on a set schedule? It's, it's part of congressional budget negotiations. Uh, there, mm-hmm. there isn't a, yeah, there isn't like a precise time for it. It's just part of the overall budget. And how much could you, uh, can you quantify how much the, uh, AC, the city has received in, was over those five years through, through the waiver funds? I don't have the number off the top of my head. We can certainly get that to you. Um, I can tell you that in terms of some of the improvements Deputy Farber referenced with reducing caseloads, there was about $30 million a year flowing to that. Okay. Um, so, so substantial amounts of funding. Yes, um, absolutely. That can't necessarily be made up um, by, by uh, CTL, um, you know, very I, easily at least. Certainly not very easily. Uh, it, it, you know, speaking frankly, this is uh, one of the budget difficulties that we all collectively face going into next year. So we mm-hmm. are definitely very much looking to uh, the next federal budget for for some kind of resolution on this. Um. I might jump around a little bit, um, um, but I'd like to start with um, uh, the ha- housing issues. Um, uh, just as it, as it pertains to the bill, how has, um, first off, how many referrals has ACS made uh, to, um, uh, to DS at? to DSS for city FEPS, um, the city FEPS program. The reason I ask is that in, um, you know, when this, we, we initially introduced this bill in, in 2018 um, and held off from passing the bill 
um, because the city FEPS rules process was underway and um, the rules allowed for these referrals um, um, from other agencies. So that would also include um, RHY, um, you know, referrals from, from DYCD as well. Um, and, uh, and we wanna make sure that young people are having access to the program. Um, so it, it could, if you could speak to that a little bit, how many have been referred, how many referrals actually ended up with somebody getting an apartment, that kind of thing. Um, thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, as you know, uh, helping youth secure safe and stable housing when they leave foster care is a critical priority for ACS, a critical priority for the task force. Um, I do want to reiterate that ACS does not discharge any youth to homelessness. Um, we keep young people in care with us until they have um, stable housing. Um, we have young people that are going to NYCHA. We have young people that are going to supportive housing. We have young people that are going to FUP vouchers. And I'm very pleased to share that even during the pandemic, um, that has not slowed down at all. Um, in fact, I think we had more young people going to NYCHA, you know, in this period this year than compared to last year. So um, that is good news that, that those things are still moving forward and that young people, even when they turn 21, they still, we are, they are not kicked out of foster care. They stay with us until they have a safe and stable place to go. And of course, you know, council member that uh, state and federal funding end um, for children and foster care at age 21, but the city continues to fund the full bore of those costs. Um, and so ACS is continuing to work with you know, other city agencies, including NYCHA and HPD, as well as DSS, to explore all possible options for young people. Um, and so I will turn to my colleague, Erin, um, for more detail about city FEHEP specifically. Sure, thank you, Julie, and thank you for the question. Um, Council member, you referenced, um, you know, some of the work that was going on a couple of years ago in respect to uh, the city FEHEPS rule um, and the work that the agency was doing uh, in respect to that. And we continue those conversations um, with ACS in terms of the referral pathways um, and look forward to continuing those conversations, really making sure um, that we are targeting this resource to these vulnerable populations. Okay, uh, had there been any um, referrals made from the agents from ACS to um, to DSS for a city FEPS voucher for youth aging out since the rule went into effect? Apologies, I had muted myself. Um, okay. So since the rule went into effect, the referral process, uh, we've continued to work with ACS in terms of determining how best to target that resource for these young people um, getting at the population um, that would be entering into shelter. Um, so, I mean, I, I, but have there been any have there been any actual um, referrals or has any, has any youth aging out of care received a, um, a city FEPS voucher? So the referral process continues to be underway in terms of the discussion uh, between the two agencies. Um, there, are, there are youth who have aged out of foster care who have received the city FEPS voucher by virtue of meeting the other criteria under the rule. Um, I'd have to Which get other criteria would that be? So the 200% of poverty, um, the 90 day requirement. Uh, being the 90 day requirement of being in shelter. That's correct. Okay, so just to be clear. So if, if, a, if a youth aging out of care receives a city, has received a city fest voucher, which we can't necessarily can, confirm whether any youth that's aging out of care has received a city fest voucher, they would have had to have been in shelter for 90 days. That's correct. Um, okay. 
um, I mean, obviously, the, the purpose of this proposed legislation is to make sure that youth don't ever go into shelter in the first place. Um, and uh, we, you know, we have, um, as I said in my uh, opening statement, uh, in 2018, 23 youth who aged out of foster care ended up in a DHS shelter within one year of aging out. Um, that's in, in calendar year 2018. Um, and then obviously there are others that are not ending up in DHS shelter, but are um, that are couch surfing or other types of unstable housing. Um, you know, we all know, um, uh, you know, different types of uh, unsafe um, living arrangements. Um, you know the, um, you know, sex for shelter and and uh, you know really really uh, in, um, unacceptable and um, uh, terribly terribly uh, unfair to these youth um, living arrangements um, that they should never be placed in and and um, um, we know that that's happening. Um, and so, you know, when I see 23 youth who have aged out, ending up in a DHS shelter within a year, to me, that's that's the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that I'm not seeing there. Um, um, I'm seeing what we're catching in, you know, reportable data, but we're not seeing the rest of that iceberg that's underwater. Um, so. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, just to be clear, I mean, I'm, you know, we went through a process. I testified at the rule, um, the rulemaking hearing um, on this issue. Um, you know, I did not proceed with this legislation because the city said that they would be addressing this through the rule. Um, if we're seeing that, you know, A, the, there are still youth that are ending up in shelter within a year of aging out, and B, um, not a single youth aging out has been able to obtain a city FEPS voucher without first going into shelter for 90 days, you know, um, I, I, I just don't see any other option but to legislate this because again we we talked about this a couple of years ago and um you know i i feel like i received some assurance that this would happen that agency referrals would happen um and uh you know i, I appreciate that that the city keeps you paying for youth in care beyond uh, age 21 is not discharging anybody into the shelter obviously that's that's good um, but, you know, it, within a year, that's, that's not, you know, that's not okay. And, um, and we have some responsibility there. Um, again, not even really factoring in the unstably housed, uh, situations. Do we do, uh, Commissioner Farber, do we have a sense of how many young people um, are dis, you know, are, are discharged from care in, um, and within a year end up in, in one of those unstable living arrangements, couch surfing, things like that. Are we able to track it? I don't think we have the data that way. Um, you know, we have the local uh, 145 data that we that we produce for you, um, which indicates, you know, a, a good number of young people going to NYCHA, a good number of young people going um, to supportive housing, a proportion of young people who are turning 21 but staying in care, staying with us. Um, we have a, a proportion of young people who are in college room and board, you know, which is a good thing. Um, and then a proportion of young people who are with uh, family and friends when they exit. Right, right. I mean, family and friends is such a vague category. That's, uh, I guess, you know, certainly concerned about, you know, 
who are these friends? You know, I think that that would be um, uh, a question of, you know, what does that mean, friends? Um, because as we know, I mean, youth that are aging out don't have the types of support systems that um, other 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 young people with you know with a, with the family structure have and um seem, it seems like an uh an a invitation for you know not not great living in not not great living in uh, arrangement incentives um if you don't have stable housing and you're gonna you know you need stable housing it just it, you know you'll you'll live with people or um, engage in behavior that might not necessarily be in your best interest um, because, you know, you can get you can get a roof over your head. So I think a couple of things I would add also is we have a supervision to 21 unit, um, which is for young people who have elected to sign themselves out of care at age 18 or 19 or 20. Um, and that unit exists to provide support to those young people um, in case they, um, you know, end up being in a, in a situation that is unstable, and we then work with those young people and provide support. We also have a, um, an alert system with DSS that when there is a young person who enters the shelter system, which, you know, which fortunately is, is quite rare, um, that we then coordinate with DSS. And just contextually, you know, obviously, you know, the experience of every single young person is critically important to us. And that mm -hmm. 23 young people you know, are showing up in a shelter within a year. Um, is a concern. Um, but what we have seen over the last um, five years um, is that number has been drastically reduced. Um, I think it was 36 the prior year. I think a couple of years ago it was 77. Um, and so we are making progress in this area. Uh, and clearly we want to reduce that to zero. Um, right. And and it's possible. I mean, you know, we think about what we've done for veterans homelessness. Um, um, you know, that was a much, much uh, higher number. I mean, this was about a thousand. It went from about a th over a thousand uh, down to single or low double digits within, uh, you know, a couple of years through a coordinated action between the city and federal uh, resources. I mean, 23, just to put into some kind of context, I don't have the MMR in front of me, but, um, you know, the number of youth that aged out in 2018 was probably in the six or 700 range. 600, thank um, you. Yeah. 600, so 23 out of 600 is like, you know, what's, what is that, about 3%? That's, that's, that's actually pretty high, I would think, you know, uh, the number of, you know, percentage of youth aging out, ending up in shelter within, within a year, you know, that's, that's, that's not a negligible, it's not a negligible number. Um, and again, this is a, it's, it's, I'm not really pinning it on a single agency. There's a, there's the, the kind of coordination here. Frankly, you know, I, I, I mean, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense that, as, that they should, I don't understand why they're not having a, a, a voucher in hand upon discharge. If you're not being discharged into a NYCHA apartment, um, you know, in any event, they should be discharged with a voucher. A voucher, it, it, it um, you know, they'll be able to afford an apartment, maintain an apartment with, with a voucher if, if they get one. I mean, and, and we know, I mean, vouchers are used for roommate situations. Um, uh, Certainly, I mean, <laughs> all of the, I mean, I've worked with DSS on, on constituent cases where, you know, that's, that's been part of it is, you know, there's, 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 there's not a lot of single adult um, opportunities out there because of the cost of housing. And the, this is this other issue of the, the, the rate of the voucher, but, um, you know, they can, they can be in a roommate situation. I just, it's, it's, you know, kind of beyond me why we can't at this point at the end of 2020 um, have a voucher for the 600 young people minus 
the those that are moving into NYCHA. Um, and how many move into NYCHA a year? How many are discharged directly into NYCHA? Um, it's like about 120. Okay, so six, so 600 minus 120, four, 480. Those 480 young people that are aging out should have a voucher, even if they have an apartment lined up. They should have a voucher because with a voucher, they pay 30% of their income towards the rent. Well, if their income, if they're working as a, you know, uh, in retail and they can only get 26 hours a week um, and they're pulling in $600 a week or something like that, you know, they should only be paying 30% of that to their rent anyway, but that should preclude them from getting their own apartment. So, you know, I'm just, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm very disappointed that we aren't, you know, the answer to my question wasn't, yeah, we have 400 kids or 350 kids leaving, um, the, leaving the foster care system with a voucher every year. Like, you know, that's, that's what I would have hoped um, the response would have been, so. Um, uh, and then just really quickly, how many, just as, as we're kind of talking about it, how many, um, how many young people um, out of the RHY system have received uh, uh, a city FEPS voucher or how many are receiving a city FEPS voucher a year? I will have to get back to you on that. I don't have that data with me today. Okay. Something we can certainly follow up with after the hearing. Okay. Because I, I mean, if I can, I don't. I mean, I'll have to look at the, you know, just kind of jurisdictionally within our committees. But like, I'll, I'm, I'm looking to add in. I don't want to pit um, RHY youth from, you know, against foster youth. So, you know, I'm just going to combine. I mean, if I can, I'm just going to combine them into one bill and make sure that, you know, every every young person in in uh, their RH DYCD system, you know, automatically has a, a right to a, to a voucher. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues if they have questions. Uh, anyone have questions? Bob, Barry, Vanessa? None. Anyone for questions? Um, okay. Maybe they maybe they will a little bit. Brad, Bob, got questions? Okay. Hey, Bob's got a baby too. What? <laughs> I want to see a baby. Look at Councilmember Holden. There's a baby. Oh, is, there, is this a grandkid, Bob? Oh my God! Are you babysitting? Yes. <laughs> You're like me. I'm babysitting like you. Yes, I'm taking your lead. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> who is this, by the way? I'm sorry. Who 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 is this young person that we're seeing on the screen? Granddaughter Caroline. Fifteen yeah. months. 15 months. Oh boy, there you go. See? Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll get back. Thank you, welcome Caroline. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, folks. Um, thanks. Um, uh, Commissioner, I want to ask about the dorm project. Um, you know, uh, uh, maybe a year ago or a year in in change ago, um, we heard some concerns about the dorm project discontinuing in Staten Island. Is that, has that been resumed or uh, can you speak a little bit about what's, what's happened in Staten Island? So yeah, the dorm pro project um, did discontinue in Staten Island and we focused on the program at um, Queens College and um, 
City College um, and John Jay. Now, of course, um, that has changed since COVID, um, since those dorms were closed. And so now the actual dorms that are operating are still the Queens College dorm, as well as the Hunter College dorm that I just mentioned. But um, what I'd also like to point out is that we have made, I think, a, a positive um, adjustment to the program in that um, students at CUNY are eligible now to receive support from New York Foundling in terms of tutor tutoring and college success coaching. All of those supports are available whether you're living in a dorm room or not. Um, and so the, the living in the dorm is not sort of the central requirement. Um, now those support services are being provided both to young people who are in dorms and are not. So that's a positive, um, you know, positive development. Um, I'm just going to go through some. I mean, I will be kind of jumping around a little bit, but but um, uh, focusing on on some of the permanency issues. Um, um, ACS created in 2018 the 10 new kinship specialists within the Division of Child Protection. Are yeah. they all currently filled right now? I and are they? So. Okay, yes, and they're they are. okay. Wonderful. Yeah, and they're and those, active those... and and highly effective. Great, and they're um, obviously borne out by the data, um, yes. and and those are not um, those are not at risk in terms of you know we're looking ahead at at um, having having some um, belt tightening in the next uh, few months through a November plan and a. Uh, preliminary budget is are, are, are we looking to make sure that those are maintained and and not at risk uh not to my knowledge they're not at risk um has anything within um um uh, your division um uh been targeted for cuts in the november plan so I will um, defer that question to my colleague, Michael Moiseev, who I know is prepared to address that. Okay. Uh, so uh, nothing specific to the division. Uh, there is a citywide initiative in the November plan that recognizes the hiring freeze that all agencies have been under and that applies across the board. Uh, but Basically, it's the hiring freeze for everyone, and then for foster care, that's it. Um, and then for the rest of ACS, are there any programmatic cuts? No, not in November. Not in November. Okay. Um, how much has how much out of ACS has been um, realized in savings from the hiring freeze? Uh, it was uh, it was seventy five positions. I, I'm still just working with OMB okay. because the budget just came out yesterday. But yeah, seventy five positions. Okay, so that's it for ACS. The seventy five accredited positions, basically. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm not great, but <laughs> good to know. Anyway. Could be worse. Could be better. Could be worse. <laughs> right. Right. Um, do we feel like the the ten kinship specialists um, are is sufficient for the number of young people entering foster care um, right now. So about 3,000 children entered foster care in 2020. Is that, is that, is our 10 enough or do we need more to be effective? So the 10 kinship specialists, um, you know, they work in a couple of ways. I mean, they're, they're supporting work on individual cases, but they're also supporting, um, you know, groups of CPS staff and supervisors in their work through training and technical assistance and consultation. And so, oh. you know, the, their, their own caseload. Um, and right. so that I think has contributed significantly to just a culture um, within DCP of total attention and focus on kin um, by all staff. Um, and the, the kinship specialists are essentially the, you know, sort of the, the cheerleaders and the champions of that work, but it's, it's not them alone that implement the kinship work. 
Right. Right. Um, do you think that 10 is sufficient, at least at the moment? I'm sure you could use more, but 10 is getting the job done. I mean, I think it's been incredibly effective, as you've seen, you know, we've increased from 31 to 41%. I mean, we're always assessing, you mm -hmm. know, and thinking about, you know, opportunities and, um, you know, when and where it makes sense to shift, um, you know, and responsibilities. Where was the target percentage in laid out in the, I'm, I'm forgetting at the moment, but there's, that's up around the target percentage that um, laid out in the task force report, right? We had set a target of 46% and we're, we're mm -hmm. not quite there, but we're determined to get there. Um, and it's moving in that direction. Can, and it's definitely moving in that direction. And, um, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're doubling down um, and doing additional analyses and looking at sort of what are the targeted strategies, both across the DCP offices, as well as across the foster care agencies to continue that trajectory. Great. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the Parent Advisory Council and how often you're meeting? Um, uh, have, have any rec recommendations or initiatives come out of that um, engagement? Um, do you feel, I mean, you mentioned that it's sometimes tough conversations. Are the conversations tough enough? Do we feel like there's, a, there's a, a, you know, enough uh, um, of a, um, you know, of a voice for parents in that throughout through that setting. Yeah, thank you for that question. And it's really, it's incredibly important work um, that we're diving in very deeply, um, which is which I think is a really good thing. And Sabre Jackson leads a group of about 20 um, parent advocates who are um, strong, thoughtful, strategic, fierce, informed advocates. And um, they are focusing on things, you know, sort of large and small, and sometimes even small is not really small. Um, mm -hmm. They have, have worked, um, one of the concrete accomplishments is they worked to adjust a, a form that gets submitted to court um, that describes, um, you know, um, parents' participation, um, and uh, I think it's a it's a summary form from uh, family team conferences that needed a an expanded section on family strengths, and they advocated to DCP and FCLS to update the form and reflect that, and that change was made, and the form was changed, and it was rolled out in August. Um, so that's that's one example. Um, mm -hmm. Members of the Parent Advisory Council um, have been involved in training parent advocates um, recently um, under the new prevention contracts, um, you know, that were issued under the, the uh, RFP uh, under my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Jackie Martin. Um, they've been involved in that. They have a number of subcommittees um, that are focused on conferencing, on the role of parent advocates, on um, the Children's Center, on um, education. Um, the task, the 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 pack meets at least one monthly as a full pack, and then there's many other committees. Um, in addition, um, ACS has really invested significant resources in the PAC um, to support the PAC to really, um, you know, be able to be staffed and supported. You know, when you have a, a, a council, it, it needs staff resources. And so mm -hmm. we have put staff resources to it. And we have also engaged in, um, speaking of your, your question about tough conversations, we are doing um, race diversity intersectionality um, facilitated conversations with Candida Brooks Harrison, who is an expert um, on facilitating conversations that are really around looking at racism, race power dynamics, um, and ACS and the PAC have had a session together. The PAC has, is having sessions on this, um, and it really speaks to our commitment to, 
to have these difficult and challenging conversations about um, the the power dynamics that underlie the relationship, and then the you know the substantive issues um, about which we're concerned and which PAC members are concerned and want to move forward. Um, We've also brought in another resource to support the PAC. There is an entity called the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, and they're a national group, and they run the Birth Parent National Network. And so they work with parent advisory councils around the country to you know, support them to be strong and effective and um, you know, strong advocates. And so we've brought them in as well um, to support the PAC. And so um, we're excited how many about members are How many members are on the PAC? About and how 20. are they, and, okay. And how, how are they, how do they get on the PAC? So when the commissioner first <clears throat> announced the PAC, um, there was an application process and people applied to be part of it. Um, and uh, and it's they, open to uh, it's open to parents who uh, currently have kids in care and those who at some point had kids in care. It's parents with lived no experience. Um, I think okay. that um, most of the parents, it's um, previous lived experience. Previous, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they're, um, they're a wonderful, powerful group um, that is, you know, pushing us appropriately. Um, to have conversations about all manner of things. That's great. That's great. Um, uh, uh, in the initiative, there's a family time pilot um, that ACS launched in from fall of 2018 to fall of 2019 to implement strategies to improve the quality of family time practices. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this in your testimony. What 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 did ACS learn um, through that process? So thank you for that question. And you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, family time is absolutely critical um, to mm -hmm. successful reunification outcomes. And so in this pilot, four agencies um, received grants um, to implement strategies to try and improve both the quantity and the quality of family time. And, you know, they were doing things like working out processes to hold <coughs> more visits, you know, sort of in creative locations, using kin to supervise visits, dedicating staff to help coordinate those visits, um, you know, being creative about food and other activities um, as a way to have high quality visits, um, using technology, you know, and I think this is, you know, there's a few things that I think we've learned through COVID, um, you know, sort of necessity is the mother of invention, but which their strategies um, that will be helpful to continue using um, moving forward. Um, and, and one of those is, you know, there are these apps um, that were originally designed for grandparents so that grandparents who are far away could read bedtime stories to their kids, but they're great, right? They're great for this purpose as well. Um, and, and so the, um, you know, the, the work that we've done with the pilots um, has been shared with all of the agencies, um, you know, with the idea for them to work to incorporate and implement these strategies. And we're providing regular data to the agencies on their, you know, frequency and utilization of family time. And so this will be a, you know, a, a continued um, major priority for us. Um, have you seen any issues around recruitment of um, foster parents as part of COVID? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for that question. And so, as I mentioned in my testimony, we, we really, we were knocking it out of the park uh, from FY17 to FY19. You know, we increased foster parent mm -hmm. recruitment by 50%. We're so proud of that. And yes, COVID um, has had an impact, um, you know, as, as you might guess. Um, however, we have implemented a number of strategies um, to try and mitigate that. And um, I'd like to refer, if it's okay with you, council member, to my colleague, um, Associate Commissioner Ina Mendez, who leads that home away from home work, and she can speak to the strategies that we've implemented during COVID pertaining to foster parent recruitment and support. 
Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Farber and Council Member. Um, as Julie mentioned, we did pivot when COVID hit. And so we worked with the providers on how they can continue their recruitment efforts um, given social distancing requirements and working remotely. So a lot of the recruitment um, efforts did move to a virtual platform and we provided um, support and guidance to the providers and they use various um, virtual platforms, Zoom, FaceTime, WebEx to host orientations. We work very closely with the state so that all of the training materials could be offered virtually because customarily training foster parent training is done in a group format. So we had to take the curriculum, you know, adapt it so uh, to a virtual environment, provide support on how they could lead the trainings. And then they get, had trainings for prospective foster parents virtually, and then provided guidance to foster parents because all of the um, certification requirements remained in place. So how can you get a medical, you can use telehealth or um, accessing various clinics that were actually seeing people in person so they could get the medicals. So we continue to do all of that. And one of the lessons learned we um, have been implementing for a few years through Home Away From Home is using foster parents as um, the um, champions and the cheerleaders um, in engaging their family, social circles, peers, in the benefits of foster parenting as a recruitment um, tool. So we supported the agencies who supported their foster parents to have those kind of conversations, either through FaceTime um, or on Zoom. So those were those were efforts that we continue to put in place um, during the pandemic. Um, is there, have, have one concern that's, um, come up for, for us was it, um, with challenges uh, due to COVID um, uh, and the challenges around recruitment that are associated with that, um, are we seeing the length of stay um, at the Children's Center um, creep up during COVID? Are we tracking that you know month to month to see if there's an impact? Um, uh, on on the, 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 the average length of time that, that young people are staying at, at uh, the Children's Center? Because I know that there's, you know, the, obviously ACS has done a lot of work in the last, um, in the last 18 months to two years around the Children's Center um, and bringing that, that length of stay down. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, we do regularly track, uh, obviously, the census and length of stay there. Um, I don't have the length of stay data in front of me, but what I do know um, is that the census has remained relatively low over the last several months. Um, it's been, you know, somewhere between the 30s and the 60s. Um, and so we have been able to um, you know, maintain uh, social distancing and, um, you know, a, a range of sort of programs and strategies at the, at the Children's Center to ensure the well-being of young people there. Um, okay, if we could follow up and just, uh, I'd be interested to see the month by month just to, to keep track on, on like, like length of stay and, and, pop and yep. the number of children there. We will do um, it. <clears throat> Great. Um, with the Parents Guide to Child Protective Services and the Handbook for Parents and Children in Foster Care, do these, um, have, have they been released yet publicly, the updated versions? They have not. Um, they've been drafted and uh, have received tons and tons of feedback. And um, they were delayed in part to, to the SCR legislation and then in the context of COVID. And so uh -huh. we have drafts um, that we want to circulate back um, through the Parent Advisory Council and, and some other folks. Um, but we we are excited to get those documents out, which we think will be very helpful to parents. Great, and incorporating then the, the SCR legislation, which is good. As relevant, yes, since it, yeah. it doesn't go into effect for a little bit, but you're right. Okay, when does that go into effect? I believe um, 2022, uh, January oh. 2022. I didn't, I didn't realize it was so long. Um, uh, and then it's, uh, that includes parents, you know, an, uh, an extensive list of, of parents' rights 
um, and how to exercise those rights. Yes. Yeah. And resources and information and tips and, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's um, intended to be written, you know, in a user friendly way so it's accessible for parents, um, which is, you know, a key, key, key piece that, um, you know, that's an example of how work mm -hmm. with parent advocates and the pack is, is critical because they um, help us with to ensure that that language um, is understood by the audience. Um, and and uh, is it in a range of languages so, available? Um, we will be having it translated. Yes, we will be having it translated into a range of languages. Okay. Yeah. Um, and obviously, <clears throat> you're open to working with um, elected officials if they're hearing that um, there are language issues in their in their districts. You know, you're open to you know, receiving those issues and trying to work through them. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. please share those with us. Um, okay, so, uh, moving on to just some education questions. Um, the in 2019 DOE hired uh, approximately 100 school based community coordinators mm -hmm. um, to connect highly mobile youth, including students experiencing homelessness and students in foster care. Are do you know if these positions are currently filled and funded? I'm assuming they're in the DOE budget, but. Um, I believe they are, um, and I believe they mm -hmm. are operating. Um, and I will turn to my colleague, Yuri Pollack, who might be able to provide a little bit uh, more detail. Yes, um, thank you, um, Deputy Commissioner Farber, and thank you um, for that question, council member. Um, my understanding is that the coordinators um, have been hired and we have provided um, you know, uh, training on foster care issues for them. Okay. Um, what does that training, do you know what that training consists of? Um, it, it was um, conducted by, um, by, by the lead, um, by the lead education person on my team. Um, just, you know, generally, uh, you know, uh, 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 talks about the status of, 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 you know, foster parents and students in foster care, um, kind of, you know, what, um, what needs our students have in terms of school stability, um, kind of um, talking about uh, really, um, you know, um, trauma-informed um, informed practice and the special needs that our students have, um, making sure that there's really great communication between the schools um, and the coordinators and, you know, foster students and foster um, parents. So it's, you know, really um, making sure um, because as, as, you know, um, as you, you know, might be aware, um, you know, there's a great focus at the DOE around students in temporary housing. Um, we want to make sure to work with the DOE uh, that there's strong recognition of students in foster care as a special population as well. Um, so just making sure that um, that those community coordinators really have you know knowledge around what the needs of our uh, foster care students are. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the task force had recommended that a th thank you very much. Um, uh, Yuri, um, the task force recommended that ACS and DOE explore ways to connect sixth graders in foster care as well as any seventh and eighth graders who are over age for their grades, which is approximately 400 students. Um, it, the task force recommended that they explore that the agencies explore ways to connect these students to tutoring services. Um, is there any advancement made on that recommendation? So I, th I think what you're referring to, council member, is the middle school for all initiative. Is that is that what you're referring to? Mm, I'm not sure. I can try to match those up, but. Okay. Um, well, so um, there's a middle school for all um, initiative, which supports sort of, you know, helping young people, seventh graders, um, you know, planning for their, you know, their educational futures. But perhaps you're referring to, um, you know, just the, the tutoring um, that is now available through Fair Futures um, to all young people ages 11 through 21. Um, and we have um, hundreds, um, mm -hmm. if not thousands, I don't have that number in front of me. Um, of young people who are now receiving tutoring. 
Okay, so that's Fair Futures that yeah. is kind of, but that's but Fair Futures is is not available to every. It's not. Is it available to every youth who? Every who youth wants age to eleven to twenty one, every single youth. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. That that I think that that meets that question. I, I I I'm trying to find it on the um, in the report itself, but I'll I'll move along on that. Um, okay. Right. Bear with me for a moment here. No worries. Um, the task force also recommended creating an office similar to the DOE Office of Students in Temporary Housing for students in foster care. You know that DOE has begun to incorporate foster care information in training for borough office staff and school-based designated liaisons. Do we see that as enough um, to meet the needs of foster care students or do we still believe that a dedicated office would be beneficial within the DOE? I mean, I'll, I'll ask Yuri to say a few more words in detail, but um, you know, our experience is that, you know, we have a set group of folks at the DOE that we work with around um, foster care issues and um, they've put together the guidance and the website and there's a sort of a range of, um, you know, resources and supports for youth in foster care that we're regularly coordinating um, with, uh, you know, the DO DOE team on these issues. Um, I don't know if Yuri, you can speak in addition, you know, to the structures um, that DOE has put in place. Sure. Um, I would say thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner Farber, and thank you, Councilmember Levin, uh, for that question. We do work very closely with the DOE. We have a strong relationship with them. Um, the, the, you know, um, a division of, you know, youth and community development or school and community mm -hmm. development. We work very, very closely with them. Um, you know, in addition to doing, you know, trainings with, uh, with the community coordinators, uh, you know, we've done, um, you know, uh, trainings with school attendance officers, other DOE staff, um, you know, for example, recently around school transportation issues, we worked very closely with the DOE to put together a very strong plan um, to make sure that all youth in care receive transportation this, you know, past fall. Um, we, uh, there's a, you know, citywide, um, um, uh, there's a citywide coordinator on um, child ab abuse maltreatment, um, or uh, uh, on child abuse and maltreatment prevention, sorry. Um, we work very closely with him and his team around educational neglect issues, around coordinating coordination issues. Um, and um, we work very closely with the Office of Students in Temporary Housing as well. They actually recently issued policy guidance um, around, um, around remote learning um, for you know, that, that population in the midst of the pandemic and on best practices um, that school officials should be undertaking. Um, so certainly, I think we always want um, our youth in care uh, to be at the forefront of what DOE does. Um, and I would say we have a strong relationship with them, um, and we hope to continue that going forward. Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, okay, I just have a couple of more questions. Um, uh, moving on to health and mental health. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, ACS is working with its provider agencies uh, to maximize the use of uh, Medicaid redesigned services to support youth in care. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak about what mental health services are available to youth who do not meet Medicaid's requirement for medical necessity? And I'm, I mean, if, I'm not totally familiar with what meets the needs of medical necessity, but or meets that standard. But if you could speak a little bit more around that um you know what services are then available for the youth that are not at that level so all children in foster care are eligible for medicaid i, I think you're talking are you talking about sort of 
when um, you know young people have an issue that doesn't rise to the level Correct. of being a Medicaid reimbursable service, right? Yep. So yep. I I mean in in that in that zone, um, you know, we are um, training foster parents um, around, you know, providing trauma sensitive support for young people, uh, training for uh, foster care agency staff focuses on how to provide supports for young people and how to identify when they might need something more when they you know when they might need um, you know mm -hmm. a, mental, a f more formal mental health evaluation and support um, the you know coaches um, through fair futures you know a, a, a major role for them is sort of constantly checking in and assessing you know, uh, yeah. assessing well-being um, and and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really think of that as the, you know, really the the major role of foster care agency case planning staff and, and foster parents and the, you know, sort of the, the regular infrastructure is to identify and, and provide support for young people. And then when it traverses over into something, you know, more clinical, um, where there really are, you know, mental health services needed, um, uh, the new set of services available under Medicaid through CFTSS um, are actually quite exciting. Um, and there are six or seven new services. Um, the state has gradually been rolling out these services over the last two years. Um, and uh, these services can pay for um, youth peer support, they can cover family peer support, they cover psychosocial rehabilitation, they cover uh, community psychiatric supports and treatment. And um, what's also interesting about these services is they can be out of the office. They can be, you know, sort of in non-traditional locations. Um, and so, and all all um, staff at at the agencies are, you know, trained on kind of uh, what's available under Medicaid redesign and and the services and kind of how to how to go through that process and um, so that they're not beating their heads against the wall trying to get these services. Uh, reimbursed or given. Yeah, so there are folks at each of the foster care agencies who, you know, have expertise, um, you know, in, in how to um, identify the need for these services, make referrals for these services. Many of the foster care agencies themselves are licensed to deliver these services. And if they're mm -hmm. not, um, you know, they're, they're accessing them from other providers that are providing them. Um, but mm -hmm. it is, there is also um, significant opportunity, you know, as like, as I said, these have just been coming online gradually over the last couple of years, including some new ones that just came online, I think this past year, um, we are working to build the foster care agency's capacity to help them fully leverage um, these services. Um, and again, they're, they're paid for by Medicaid. So it's in addition, um, you know, to the support that, um, you know, the, that foster care agencies receive you know, through their ACS contracts. Mm -hmm. Fully reimbursed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know that uh, Council Member Holden has a question, so I'll turn it over to Council Member Holden. And, and Council Member, I just want to say that your granddaughter very well behaved um, compared to my son, who's not in the house at the moment, but it, whenever he comes, he's, you know, batting me in the face, tugging on my ear, pulling out my headphones you know, running away with my iPad. So I was very impressed. Well, she does all of that too. So uh, I just have to put a nursery <laughs> rhyme on for her to keep her occupied. So uh, my daughter doesn't allow that many nursery rhymes uh, to be played, but uh. when I'm watching her, I have to do, yeah. I have to do Grandpa. it. But anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin, for this uh, terrific hearing and very informative uh, information obviously on the testimony by uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber. I thank you for that. And um, mm -hmm. give, please give my regards to Commissioner Hansel. He's done okay. a terrific job, all of you with, with the task force, by the way. Uh, it sounds amazing. Uh, I just wanna, I just have a question. Maybe I asked it at the last hearing, but when you are identifying family of children, um, do you include out of state, if they're out of state, uh, that you might send the uh, child there? 
We do. Um, and thank yeah. you for asking that question, right. um, because it's all part of being creative. And sometimes it turns out that there's an ant in you know Rhode Island who is interested and has been connected to the child. Um, and so that's a really important part of the work that our Division of Child Protection staff do, as well as our foster care agencies to really do um, research uh, and talking with the family and talking with children um, and talking with teachers and coaches and, you know, um, to identify all possibilities. Um, and the other thing I want to um, take advantage, um, since you've provided an opening, um, to mention that um, we actually just negotiated and signed an agreement um, with New Jersey. Um, it's called a border agreement. Um, and the purpose of that agreement is essentially to make the clearance process um, a little less cumbersome, as you can imagine. Um, it's called ICPC, Interstate Compact on the Placement of Children, and it's complicated. Um, and so we've now signed a, a border agreement um, with New Jersey to expedite and facilitate kinship placements going both ways um, for New Jersey and New York City kids in foster care. Great. Well, um, just uh, shifting to the mentoring and internships that you mentioned, um, uh, do you include city agencies and let's say community boards or even the council offices uh, for internships? Because um, I think it would be beneficial if, if the child stayed, you know, and I'm talking about a teenager probably here, 16 to 18 or so, um, could work uh, in a community board office in their community or and, and get also some mentoring um, in the process. Um, do, you, do you consider that? I mean, I would love to mentor um, a child, uh, certainly, uh, you know, somebody in the community that um, would benefit. Um, well, thank you for that. And I think we'd love to take you up on, on that um, suggestion, both, you know, for you and your office, but also just community boards in general. Um, and if I can, I'd love to refer um, to my colleague, Assistant Commissioner Raymond Singleton, who um, has done unbelievable work. I mean, before the pandemic, but since the pandemic, he's going 8 million miles an hour, um, providing internship opportunities um, for young people. And so I'd love for him to share a little bit about that. Um, but I do think that the opportunities for placements, you know, at community boards um, and, in, and in your office and other offices um, would absolutely be on the table. So I'd like to refer to, to Ray Singleton. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Barber, and, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Holden, for asking that question. Um, I think it's it's an incredible opportunity that uh, you're giving us to partner up with you and offer a work site. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that at ACS, uh, the Commissioner's Internship Program has been going on for several years. And the model that we use is to make sure that there's a one-to-one -one supervisory model so that when youth are enrolled, they're both getting coached and supervised at the same time so that they're developing a professional network uh, with the supervisors that are offering them the, the virtual work. Uh, and so through the summertime and through uh, the fall, we've been able to offer uh, both in the summer and in the fall, 100 internship sites that are a mix of both community-based organizations that provide internships where when the youth come on board, they work with executive staff and program staff in the administrative office, in uh, the tech department, in the finance office, learning the particular work that gets done uh, in those offices, but then also being able to make recommendations about how they can either do it better or what they've learned and they think the process works really, really well. So we hope that at the end of the internship experience, when youth walk out, they're able to look at the career and the profession that they worked in and look and see if this is what they want to do as a career pathway. Exactly. And they can understand uh, what the skills are that they need to develop and where they're at. And then, you know, draw a career map and a career and education plan to close that gap uh, so they can develop the skills and so on to become competitive in, in the labor market or to excel in their own business. So we welcome that opportunity. We've had uh, a lot of opportunities to improve our model and our process. And so if we can incorporate the city council uh, as a work site, we, we welcome that. We would love to do it. 
that, that'd be great. Thank you so much for your work on this and thank you all. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, uh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca as well. Um, and let's see, I, I think I just have one more question, uh, two more questions um, for, uh, for the administration here. Um, since September 2018, DOHMH has partnered with city and state stakeholders to implement a high fidelity wraparound demonstration project in the Bronx and Brooklyn for New York City children and youth with serious social, emotional, and behavioral concerns who are involved in multiple child service systems, so child welfare, juvenile justice, behavioral health, um, special education. The task force recommended that the wraparound demonstration project be expanded to include additional slots exclusively for youth with serious emotional disturbances in foster care. Um, do we know if that's, is that underway or has that been done? Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. Um, and so that pilot, um, which was a high fidelity wraparound pilot um, that DOHMH was running, um, they ran that pilot and that pilot, um, has since ended. Um, and so I would have to um, defer to my colleagues there uh, at DOHMH about plans moving forward. However, we have um, several other things that are happening in that zone, um, you know, right, right in that zone that are that are very important. And one of those is that ACS and DOHMH and OCFS and OMH have come together um, to create a new initiative called Canopy, um, which is a collaborative approach for providing enhanced services and improved outcomes for young people in foster care and crossing over into the juvenile justice system um, who have sort of the most complex trauma histories and challenges. We're talking about young people who have been in you know, many different placements. They may have substance abuse challenges. They may have mental health challenges. They may have been um, arrested um, and involved in the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And this is a relatively small group of young people, um, but a group of young people for whom it's really important that um, all of us, ACS, DOHMH, OCFS, OMH, and others, you know, are wrapping around these young people. And so we formed uh, what we call a cross-agency team that is um, looking at these cases, at looking at individual cases and coming together Wait, to... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that your house, council member? <laughs> um, bring them in. Let's see them. Um, so uh, here they go. Are they coming? <laughs> you want to come over? Say hi. No, they're they're doing their own thing. Okay. They don't want to hear about canopy. Um, <laughs> So the purpose of Canopy is really to um, make sure that we're fully leveraging the resources of the four agencies um, and bringing those resources to bear for young people who are really facing the, the toughest challenges. Um, and so we're excited about this new approach. It's sort of a system of care approach um, and really focused on um, you know, sort of wrapping resources around young people who are struggling. Um, the other thing um, that I would mention um, uh, that we've already discussed is sort of the, you know, increased focus on the CFTSS services um, because that really presents significant opportunity to expand services both for young people who are in community-based settings, who are in foster homes, as well as for young people who are, um, you know, temporarily in residential programs um, for treatment. 
Thank you, Commissioner. And um, uh, just so you know, uh, because of some uh, reorganization here at the council, I, I mentioned this to um, uh, to Stephanie yes. uh, the other day that um, uh, the General Welfare Committee will now be um, overseeing uh, the juvenile justice um, Great. system within division within uh, ACS, which um, is the first, you know, the first time, uh, at least since I've been at the council, that, that that's the case. We, you know, before going over into the, um, uh, where it has been most recently with um, council member Lanceman's committee was, there was a, a juvenile justice committee before that. And right. um, so uh, I'm happy to um, uh, to sit down with, with uh, ACS's staff um, in the in the coming weeks to to start to go over um, what's 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 happening there, but obviously um, programs like Canopy and um, you know making sure that we're getting wraparound services is very important. Yeah. Great, and I, I know our do. colleagues will be very pleased to you know discuss all of that with you. Great, um, and then okay, last question here. Um, uh, one one on, on the, uh, a housing task. Uh, the task force housing recommendation around expanding tra uh, transitional housing for youth uh, exiting foster care, such as the Chelsea foyer operated by Good Shepherd, um, which combines housing and targeted services. Um, obviously not a um, supportive housing, but a kind of different different model. Um, is there is there uh, are there any plans to expand transitional housing that would specifically target youth leaving foster care and what's the um, I'm not familiar with the the kind of funding operating structure of of that program uh, do you know can you speak a little bit to that I, I know Good Shepherd is testifying so maybe they'll they'll be able to do that as well yeah and and Good Shepherd is well positioned to talk about that and I and I think what they'll share um, is that those transitional housing programs tend to be a patchwork of, of funding um, and it takes quite a bit of work to put together the the different you know patchwork of funding um, for that purpose um, but we're very interested um, in continuing to explore this um, with you and to continue to explore you know opportunities to develop um, additional housing programs like um, you know Jeremy Cahoon Homebin has one um, at Children's Village um, in Harlem. Um, right. Right. And, and there. so yeah. um, we think that there's, you know, that there's opportunity um, to think, um, you know, more about, um, you know, whether additional programs like that um, could be developed mm -hmm. and, and, and we'd be pleased to have those discussions. Yeah, it would be interesting to pursue um, with, uh, HPD and 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 speaking with with uh, with with Jeremy and Good Shepherd, um, kind of how to maybe codify um, some kind of structural um, plans around that, so that so that there can be, you know, it can be a dedicated um, funding stream program and capital funds that can kind of um, have its own, so that it's not having to be cobbled together ad hoc, but instead having some kind of, um, you know clear guidelines on that on that front. So that'd be interesting to, to, to talk about. Yep. Great. Um, okay, uh, well, that's it for me. Do any of my colleagues have any other questions? Okay, all right, seeing none. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. Just to reiterate, I am, you know, um, you know, disappointed about the uh, city FEPS referrals um, and I am, you know, we're going to have to move forward with legislation around this issue. Um, and so, uh, we're hearing 148 today. Um, you know, we may be expanding that to include if possible, um, uh, young people in the DYCD system. Frankly, if that's not possible to add this to, to that, that to this bill, we'll be working with our colleagues in the, um, uh, 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 my colleague Debbie Rose and the um, youth committee to, um, uh, to, to pursue legislation, separate legislation, but we're gonna be moving forward on these issues and, and uh, we wanna make sure that young people, no young person is 
being discharged, you know, with, with 23 kids a year that, you know, again, that's the tip of the iceberg, but, um, you know, we should be able to do this. This is not outside of our ability to ensure that, um, you know, no young person is unstably housed leaving the system. And so that's, that's a um, real work to do, but we should be really uh, focused on that in our remaining time here. Okay. Thank you, Council okay. Member. We appreciate it. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your testimony and for answering the questions. And and look forward to uh, continuing to work further. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Council Thanks. Member. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I'll turn it back over to our committee council. Thanks again to the members of the administration for your testimony. We're now gonna to turn to public testimony. I'll be calling on individuals one by one. Panelists are going to have three minutes to testify. We ask that you limit your testimony to three minutes. And as always, you can submit longer written testimony for the record. Council members who have questions for a particular person should raise, should raise them function on Zoom. And I'll call on you after that panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to, be to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay with the unmuting function. So the first, our first public panel will be comprised of Chelsea Velez, Chowani Singh, Tamisha Simon and Erica Francois. And we are going to begin with Chelsea Velez. And again, Chelsea Velez will be followed by Chawani Singh. Over to Chelsea Velez. Hello, thank you, um, Chair Levin and the General Welfare Committee for holding this hearing and providing us with the opportunity to testify. Um, I am Chelsea Velez. I am a youth advocate at Lawyers for Children. Lawyers for Children directly um, represents individual children in foster care and advocates for a system-wide reform to improve the lives of children in foster care. Um, youth advocates such as my position in New York in Lawyers for Children are staff members who have lived experience in foster care and work with the attorneys and social workers in our Adolescents Confronting Transition Project to help older youth prepare to live on their own. I hope the City Council will read the full written testimony that LFC submitted today because it addresses both intro 148, the foster care task force. Um, because I have not, because I have limited time to speak, I am only going to specify to support the intro 148. Intro 148 will provide much needed housing options for youth transitioning out of foster care. Last year, approximately 620 young children left foster care between the ages of 18 to 21 to independent living, and they desperately need more options to help them obtain safe, stable, permanent housing. Many children leaving foster care can afford market rate apartments and have only two options for permanent housing, which is NYCHA or supportive housing. The problem is that these spots are limited, the wait lists are long, and not all youth qualify for these apartments. Um, I was one of those youth um, when I was aging out of foster care. I did not qualify for supportive housing because at the time I had a child um, and my foster care agency did not follow through in helping me apply for NYCHA. When my plan to live with a family member fell through, I had no choice but to enter into the shelter system. Entering the shelter system is disruptive and scary. A young person leaving foster care can be placed anywhere in the city, can be moved around far from their work, school, and away from their community supports. No young person should be forced to, to enter the system. Um, but some youth in care know that there are city subsidy programs that are only available for people who are homeless. And some of our clients have entered the shelter system just so that they can attain those subsidies. Ciara is a client of those typical to those young people. By the time she turned 21, she had been waiting for NYCHA housing with the ACS priority for two years. She was pregnant, frustrated, scared, and without resources. She had heard from a friend that if she entered into the shelter system, she would get housing much more quicker. 
um, than waiting in foster care. So that's what she did. Ciara entered the shelter care system in July 27th, 2018. Less than two months later, less than two months later, with the help of a rent subsidy voucher only available to her because she was homeless, she was living on her own apartment. No one should have to enter the homeless the homelessness system to get housing, especially when it can and should be preventable. Young and youth in foster care who are waiting for their own housing, especially those who are over 21, are just as vulnerable as homeless people who are in the shelter system. Youth who are 21, they have no, youth who are over 21 are in the mercy of ACS. They have no right to placement and can be turned, turned out into the street at any time. Having suffered so much trauma and instability, youth in foster care deserve better. Intro 148 will give them more housing options and most importantly, avoid further trauma and instability of not knowing where they will live without having to enter the foster, the shelter system. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chelsea, um, and thank you for putting these issues um, so clearly in front of uh, in front of us, and um, um, you know, calling us to action and making and making it clear that there are things that we can do right now and today to make the system better. So I really appreciate you taking the time to testify and your and the, uh, your testimony itself. Thank you. Thanks again, Chelsea. I'll now call on Chowani Singh, and Chowani will be followed by Tamisha Simon. Over to Chowani Singh. You may start now. Hello, council members. My name is Chowani Singh, and I've been in foster care for a little over a year and a half. Since I've been in foster care, I've lived in three different homes. The first one was a friend's family, which was a temporary placement. Therefore, I only stayed there for a short period of time. The second one was newfangled and turned out bad after a while. I continuously felt uncomfortable and sometimes disrespected. I left there after eight months and went back to stay with my birth mom for a couple of months and that was very much not a difference. I then moved in with my current foster mom and I've been there since. It doesn't feel like a hostile environment. I feel stable, at peace and relaxed. I'm also able to share my feelings with her, both good and bad, and pardon me for saying this, but she feels more like a roommate than a mother figure. She never oversteps her boundaries, nor does, she nor does she oversteps mine. She respects my space and my privacy, and I do the same for her. She respects me as I respect her. I'm contented with my placement, but I do still feel stigmatized due to being in foster care. Despite COVID-19 and the pandemic we faced, I turned 18 and managed to successfully graduate high school in June of 2020 with an advanced diploma. I now attend online classes at Queensborough Community College where I major in psychology. I concluded that grit and determination helped me to overcome all these adversities that I've had to face. Not to forget, I did have some help from the people at the Children's Village. And that's a big reason why I feel like foster care needs to be well-funded so that they can keep thriving and providing for youths like me with resources. We need to succeed. I take part in ILS, workshops and they prepare me for adulthood. I have a Fair Futures Education Specialist who has helped me to be able to attend college with extra resources, debt free. My agency's Fair Futures Employment Specialist has helped me to get my first job through their internship program, which I have became part of early March as an office assistant. I am now an IT assistant where I get an abundant amount of information and knowledge on technology. Last month, my caseworker has helped me to apply for NYCHA housing, but I'm unsure of my status. I also plan to apply for an apartment in our own CV Harlem residence. Having an apartment there is a great first step into an independent living in NYC. Since May, I've been part of CV's FAST program, which has been a big help in keeping the relationship between me and my foster parent healthy. As for now, we order takeout or delivery meals but hopefully as the pandemic eases, we will be able to use the family bonding money to actually go out and do fun things. In my perspective, I'm the living embodiment of what the values of foster care and the children's village stand for. They are there to help kids like me succeed and realize our worth despite our unfortunate circumstances. My internship here has helped me to be around influential Time's people up. who've helped me 
boost my self confidence. Thank you. So you 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 can go ahead and finish. No no, no problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I just got nervous. Sorry. Um, my okay. internship here has helped me to be around influential people who've helped me to boost my self confidence and self esteem while helping me to realize my true capabilities. They've also taught me that I'm worthy of respect and that they respect me as well as value me. Thank you for giving me your time. This means the world, especially as a foster child. Thank you, Chuani. That's uh, congratulations on on all of these achievements, um, uh, on attending college, on the internship. That sounds very exciting. Um, I don't know anything about IT, so that's an exciting. Uh, you know, so it's great that you're learning that. Um, great skills to have. Um, and also just thank you for your testimony because um, you're, you're, you're kind of, you kind of um, um, uh, said all of what we were uh, uh, trying to get at in the last two hours of this hearing. You said it all in like two minutes. So uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, I really look forward to seeing your success. Um, and I think that um, this, you know, the sky is truly the limit for you. So um, good luck with everything. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joanny. Yeah. Thanks again, Kiwani. I'm now going to call on Tamisha Simon, followed by Erica Francois. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Tamisha Simon, and I am the Program Director of Special Services and Model Fidelity at Good Shepherd Services Foster Care Division. Thank you, Chair Levin, and the Council members of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to submit my testimony. My testimony will emphasize our, how Fair Future corresponds with Task Force Recommendations 5 and 16. I have been employed with Good Shepherd Services for the past eight and a half years, and each of those years were spent in foster care. I have played an integral role with the implementation of the Fair Futures model within program. Good Shepherd Services implemented the Fair Futures model within our family and therapeutic foster care programs and our residential foster care program. There are four coaches assigned to family and therapeutic, and there are two coaches assigned to residential. Fair Futures allows providers like Good Shepherd Services to support more young people who are in care. Be prior to Fair Futures and family foster care, we had two education specialists, which were responsible for almost 300 young people, ranging from birth to 21 years of age. The team of specialists and coaches we have now allow more individualized attention to cater to the academic needs of children and youth in care. Fair Futures allows Good Shepherd to improve education, career development, permanency, and housing outcomes for young people over time. Each of us has experienced uncertainty with COVID. In addition, COVID has exasperated conditions for youth in care. Children and youth in care are struggling with remote learning and our staff are helping foster parents and youth navigate academic issues, equipment needs, connectivity issues, trauma, poverty, and the stressors and anxiety as a result of the pandemic. Fair Future Coaches help youth create opportunities to recognize their potential and allowing youth to feel comfortable within their individual progression. As a member of the Fair Futures community in New York City, youth have an opportunity to share and celebrate their accomplishments and achievements with young people in care across the city. Fair Futures is a component of supports which are available and we look forward to continuing to work with the city to identify funding streams which can support young people once they have aged out of foster care at age 21. At the core of these supports are committed individuals, individuals who are employed by nonprofits like Good Shepherd Services, at Good Shepherds, we continue to advocate for full restoration of the cuts which impacted the indirect cost rate initiative and the reinstatement of a cost of living increase for staff. Good Shepherd stands ready to support the council in ensuring all residential staff receive fair compensation for the essential work they provide youth and care across the, across the city, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you for the opportunity to submit our testimony. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tamisha. Um, I, I want to ask um, uh, about Chelsea Foyer. Do you, do you know kind of how it's structured at all, or, or is that is that in kind of your area? That is not my area. Um, Miss Elizabeth Garcia is present, and she will speak to that. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, thank you for all the great work that that uh, you do at Good Shepherd, and and um, uh, and and and. Uh, working with the, the, the programs 
um, that the task force laid out and, um, you know, and, and helping all of these young people, um, you know, achieve their potential. It's, it's, um, it's, we're, we're very much reliant as a city on, on the good work of, of the agencies to actually do the, um, the work every single day. So we greatly appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Tamisha. I'll now call on Erica Francois. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Levin and the General Welfare Committee for allowing me to testify on behalf of Fair Futures. My name is Erica Francois. I'm the Fair Futures Youth Board Coordinator. I've been a Fair Futures advocate before we solidified and the foster care youth advocate overall. I've had a coach for about three years now and I've received tutoring services. Fair Futures has been an asset to not only my life, but to many others. The resources provided were more than enough to give me the stability I needed in all areas of my life. The Youth Advisory Board is dedicated to advocating for New York City foster care youth and providing them with the necessary supports that they deserve. Since the creation of the board, we've been pretty successful. We've had our first meeting where we came up with our mission statement and what is expected of them. And our mission statement is that we believe that all youth can learn, attain greater independence, and shape their own futures. The Fair Futures Youth Advisory Board believes that each youth should lead with purpose and integrity, and the board wants to ensure youth ensure that youth reach their full potential, exercising their right to advocate and to reach an audience on their behalf. We've had a town hall with the commissioner of ACS. We've had a town hall recap on IG Live, where we picked up a lot of youth feedback because they were genuinely interested and engaged to discuss how they felt about their issues during the pandemic. I followed up with many youth as possible via email to send out COVID relief resources. And then we had our virtual rally with Borough President Eric Adams. In the midst of all this, we created advocacy videos. We spanned speaker Corey Johnson on Instagram to get awareness about fair futures and why we need to fight for it to remain alive. We created our Facebook page and had our social media and political advocacy training. And then following into July, we had another Instagram live, which was supposed to introduce the board members, but turned into expressing ourselves and leading to a protest outside that following week because we only received 2.7 million. However, that protest did not happen. We went right into action when the ACS commissioner wanted to meet with us and we got the good news. That was the pinnacle for us as a board and we realized how important our voices were and still are. For 12 million went on a gratitude video tour thanking everyone. And with all the engagement, we had another meeting with new members and another Instagram live. And before we know it, we're having regular meetings with the commissioner and his senior team again for his updates on the implementation of the progress of their futures. We continue to have trainings, workshops, and creative social media content to express the necessity of a coach and all the Fair Futures resources during a pandemic. The funding that we vigorously advocate for is to advance education, employment, affordable housing, or permanency outcomes, and preparation for all the schooling of all grades, graduation, vocational training, and gaining career development experience. Fair Futures has led other agencies to restructure their organizations, leadership, and staff within three vital areas education, housing, and employment. They are all grouped. Some of the city budget funding is baselined, which means there's an expectation, but not any certainly about what happens in the next year. However, we are proving that this program is producing the necessary impact. And it's up. Baselined. 98% of youth FaceTime their coach during the pandemic and nearly 90% of program participants have a high school diploma or equivalency by age 21, which is higher than that of the population who cannot access these supports. Imagine if these supports were continued, we would be able to reach every single foster care youth that it'll be a game changer. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Erica, and thank you for your advocacy. Um, and it's very impressive um, <clears throat> that uh, the young people have um, uh, adapted their advocacy strategy with through COVID and being able to do a lot of it online and um, through Instagram Live and um, you know things that I'm not as savvy as you are about, but um, uh, it's it's impressive and it certainly um, held our our feet to the fire and and uh, and and ACS's feet to the fire. So. Thank you for doing it. Keep keep it up. It's going to be a bad. It's going to be another bad year this year. So please, by all means, advocate, 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 rally, organize, do whatever you have to do to to make sure your voice is heard. Thank you. Thanks again, Erica. I'm now going to call up our next panel, and the next panel will be in this order: Samantha Gayadine, 
Elizabeth Garcia, Erica Palmer, and Joyce McMillan. And we are going to begin with Samantha Gayadeen, followed by Elizabeth Garcia. Over to Samantha. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. I've been working in the capacity of a Fair Futures coach since September 2019. Prior, I worked as a case planner from February 2018 to September 2019. Working with youths in foster care has been one of the most rewarding and heart-filling experiences of my life. Daily, I utilize the coaching culture, collaborated with many providers who assist our youth in numerous aspects of their lives. My youths are always appreciative of my support and guidance. Many are grateful for my weekly and holiday check-ins as they do not have an abundance of consistent individuals in their lives. Be in there to support them in their everyday struggles and on their road to success has been one of the highlights of my life. The relationship between a youth and their coach versus a youth and their case planner is incredibly different. A coach main focus is the youth. They work with youth specifically dedicated to support them with their career, education, house, and personal goals. On the other hand, case planners partner with families to create service plans for parents and children to address their needs. They monitor and document safety, well-being, and progress of case. Case planners also collaborate with service providers to monitor service, progress, and needs, participate in family team conferences and family court hearings. Due to their hectic daily responsibilities of case planners, you do not get that individual attention that they need. This results in youth feeling overlooked and not cared for. I believe consistency is key. Being a youth in foster care, consistency is not something most are familiar with. If you ask the youth how many case planners they've had, the number will baffle you. Myself being a youth in foster care from the age of 16 years old to 21 years old, I did not have consistent support. While I graduated from Hunter College and has accomplished a lot given where I started, I believe if I had a coach, I would have felt more secure in the decisions I've made and would have dared myself to do more. The pressure of feeling like no one has your back is horrendous. You do less, you're terrified to do more, terrified to fail. You end up not living up to your full potential. With the consistent motivation and support that a coach provide, Many youths will, only, will not only realize how resilient they are, but how much potential and power they have. Our youths having a coach, having that consistent support and guidance is essential. The Fair Futures program is essential. I stand by it 100%. Thank you for having me testify. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Samantha, and thanks for the amazing work that you're doing and um, and the real impact that you're making on uh, young people's lives. And to hear, um, you know, from your perspective, how Fair Futures is working um, is is very important to us, so that we know um, that it's uh, you know this isn't that this is that this is uh, tax dollars well spent. Um, and there's an important program for us to prioritize in, in this coming up budget. So thank you very much. Samantha. Thank you so much again, Samantha. Now I will call on Elizabeth Garcia, followed by Erica Palmer. Over to Elizabeth. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Garcia and I am a division director at Good Shepherd Services, uh, supervising our supportive housing programs, the Chelsea Foyer and McLaughlin East Harlem residents. Thank you, Chair Levin and the council members of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to submit testimony on intro 0148, a bill requiring that the Department of Homeless Services recognizes time spent in foster care as homelessness for the purpose of meeting rental voucher eligibility requirements. Good Shepherd Services is both a foster care and runaway and homeless youth provider. Our testimony today will focus on how recommended amendments to this legislation is an opportunity to disrupt a cycle of inequity, where for years, these two populations have not been equally prioritized for the scarce housing resources in New York City. Our recommended amendments will help meet the needs of all youth needing shelter and housing in our city. We recognize that the statistics of youth aging out of foster care and becoming homeless are of great concern. 
at the Chelsea Foyer, a transitional independent living program for youth who are experiencing homelessness, 42% of our youth have foster care lived experience and 100% are in need of stable long-term housing. The council can help address this concern by including both youth in foster care and runaway homeless youth under the at-risk and vulnerable populations for purposes of assessing the city's rental voucher program. As an example, the New York 1515 Agreement Housing Initiative did exactly this by creating, by treating both populations as vulnerable and allowing 16 to 24 year olds in foster care and RHY to access this resource based on a vulnerability index and not based on systems experience. As written, the following sections of the legislation are of concern. The legislation excludes runaway and homeless youth who are currently experiencing homelessness and who currently do not have access to this voucher. The Coalition for Homeless Youth has been advocating with the city to give RHY access to this program for years, but today RHY youth still do not have access. The legislation creates a president to continue to exclude RHY from other programs. The homeless designation for youth in foster care will be incongruent across other state and federal agencies and specifically the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which does not recognize youth in foster care as homeless. The legislation will create an undue burden for the city to provide resources to youth in care over the runaway and homeless youth population and unfairly have the populations complete for limited resources that will give youth in care priority over our expired. Thank you so much. For you, you, my you, could go ahead and, you could go ahead and finish your testimony. If that's Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Council Member. For the record, in my written testimony, which I will not go through completely, I have included the housing options that are currently available to youth who are being discharged from foster care. The list includes HRA supportive housing, NYCHA, and HPD Section 8 housing. ACS also has the housing support services, which helps families and young adults involved with foster care find suitable, stable, long-term housing. The housing options that are available to youth experiencing homelessness are limited and runaway homeless youth do not currently have access to any of the city rental vouchers. After years of advocacy, RHY only have access to New York 1515 supportive housing and limited HUD funded programs. With the lack of housing options, post their stay in the RHY system, Many youth experiencing homelessness have no other options but to enter the DHS system as an adult, which many do not want to do. This will be the only way they will get access to the city rental subsidies and in this scenario are now competing with about 54,000 other individuals in the homeless system. It is important to note that foster care agencies are not allowed to discharge a young person into homelessness. If the provider is not able to find an apartment for a young person, the young person can stay in care until the age of 23. For a young person in the RHY system, when they reach the age of 21, they are no longer allowed to stay in an RHY program. On counting youth's time in foster care as homelessness, the unintended consequence is as follows. If a young person has been in foster care since birth, they could accumulate 21 years of homelessness under this bill. Conversely, if a young person has maxed out their time in an RHY residential program, because of set length of stays in these programs, they could only accumulate a total of 2.5 years of homelessness. As many of our current housing resources prioritize length of homelessness and chronic homelessness status in determining who gets the scarce housing resources available, young people actually experiencing homelessness will never be able to compete with the foster care youth whose time in care has been designated as homeless. As a provider of both foster care and runaway homeless youth services, Good Shepherd Services stands with the recommended amendments that will be set forth by the Coalition of Homeless Youth and are prepared to support the council in amending this legislation to combat youth homelessness in New York City. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify I can answer any questions you may have at this time. 
Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, I look forward to, to looking at those recommendations and incorporating um, as many of them as possible into this legislation. Um, and I agree with you um, that um, uh, we don't want um, youth in care to be competing against um, youth in RHY shelter. Um, my position on that is that um, uh, both um, both youth in care and youth in, in RHY shelter should be prioritized. Um, that, frankly, they should be getting um, uh, access to a housing voucher. Um, you know, in regard you know re regardless of length of stay, and um, and it it should be um, essentially automatic. Um, frankly, to hear. Um, DSS say that um, they've essentially received no referrals from either agency. I mean, they said they didn't come back with any um, DYCD, but um, uh, basically they have not received a single, they haven't gotten any re referrals from ACS, um, means that that the current status quo is, is, not, is not working. Um, and um, young, if, you know, Frankly, young people more than anyone else deserve the right to have, um, you know, a priority, um, or certainly just as much as anyone else um, to have a priority um, for uh, for a place to call home. And so, I look forward to, to working with with the coalition and and um, and making that making this legislation, um, you know, a, a consensus legislation and. Um, passing it as quickly as possible. I just ask really quickly if you're able to speak to um, the Chelsea foyer um, a kind of structure of how you cobble that together and whether it's um, replicatable for other agencies. Absolutely. Uh, Councilman Me Member Levin, thank you so much for, for your support of, of our RHY and foster care youth. I definitely think we can uh, work together to create a, a very strong um, bill. So the Chelsea Foyer is a transitional independent living program. Um, it is a program where we have 40 young people, both young people who have aged out of the foster care system and young people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, Good Shepherd Services has been very creative in cobbling up different forms of funding to make this one cohesive program. So, we actually received funding from both uh, DYCD for runaway and homeless youth for 16 of the uh, units in our program. We received funding through DOH and MH uh, for, through uh, the New York Three Agreement for 14 young people who have aged out of the foster care system. And then we have an additional uh, 10 Sorry, units. that's New York, New York. <coughs> sorry, is that New York, New York Three supportive housing? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, New York, okay. New York City okay. supports housing for youth aging out of foster care. And then okay. uh, at, the, at the city level, we have that. Then we at the state level, we also receive money through NYSHIP, the New York State Supportive Housing Program. And at the federal level, we also get uh, funding through HUD um, for, uh, for homeless programming. So all together, we uh, basically put together four very different funding streams to run one cohesive program. Um, and the goal really is to help young people between the ages of 18 uh, through 25 who are in need of housing, either because they're experiencing mm -hmm. or at risk. And it doesn't really matter what system they're coming to us from. Um, so basically we have young people coming from the RHY system. We have young people coming from the foster care system. And we have young people who are coming just from organizations that have told us that these young people are either unstably housed are couch surfing uh, or for one other reason have not been able to get into a system and we work cohesively with these young people to help them figure out a plan for longer term housing because our program is only a two-year program uh, as designated by by the transitional living sort of regulation um, so in two years, yeah. we have to help a young person, regardless of how they came to us, figure out what their next step in independent living is. Um, and what we find oftentimes is that there are very few housing options for them long-term. 
Um, the young people who have come to us from foster care have a little bit of, of an opportunity to get access either to supportive housing or NYCHA, as I've already explained, but our young people who are not in that system, their, their, their resources are limited, are very, very limited. Um, and Can this I is ask, where we... how, long has it been, how long has it been in existence? The Chelsea Foy has been in existence since 2004, so 16 years. Oh. Um, and aside from Children's Village, do you know of any other programs that are, you know, doing, doing a similar thing? So most programs, so most agencies uh, for a long time have either done foster care or have done runaway and homeless youth. We were probably mm -hmm. one of the first agencies that kind of took on both populations. And in the last several years, more and more agencies have started to, um, to really service both populations. I don't know if there's any other singular program that houses both populations in one program. Um, that, in a, you know, in a transitional mo in a transitional model, instead of sure. as a shelter model, this is a more more permanent, not fully permanent, but more permanent. Right, um, more longer term, really. Yes. Right. Um, it would be interesting. I'd be interested to sit down um, with you guys and kind of try to map that out. See if that is something that um, maybe I can work with uh, soon to be Congressman Richie Torres, who is still on here, um, to see if we can um, kind of codify that that city and federal um, uh, relationship on on a program like this. Absolutely. Yeah, we would be happy to, to sit with you and, um, and soon to be Congressman Torres to, uh, to think of how we can creatively expand the work that we do to other agencies and, and really to work with other agencies to really kind of see this population as one in the same and no longer yeah. divided. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for the testimony. Thank you so much, Council Member. Thanks again, Elizabeth. I'm now going to call on Erica Palmer, followed by Joyce McMillan. Over to Erica Palmer. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the city's progress toward advancing the recommendations of the Interagency Foster Care Task Force. Um, my name is Erica Palmer. I'm a supervising attorney at Advocates for Children of New York, and I direct our foster care project. Um, back in March 2018, the task force made three recommendations focused on education for students in foster care. Um, as Deputy Commissioner Farber testified, many of the needs and issues raised in two of those recommendations are being targeted by Fair Futures. Uh, I'd like to recognize and thank the Council and ACS for its investment in Fair Futures and urge the city to baseline funding to help ensure this program's long-term stability and success. Uh, the task force's third education recommendation concerned improving service coordination and oversight at DOE to support students in foster care. The task force called for the DOE to establish infrastructure similar to its Office of Students in Temporary Housing to oversee and advise a team of borough-based foster care content experts. To date, uh, as you noted, Council Member Levin, uh, the DOE still does not have a single staff member focused full-time on students in foster care. As a result, the DOE has not implemented many necessary policies to assist these students and schools, families, and child welfare professionals have no point person to contact with questions about students in care. Uh, the pandemic has further demonstrated the need for DOE staff focused on the unique needs of this population. Such staff could have coordinated with ACS and foster care agencies to more effectively resolve barriers related to devices or Wi-Fi service for remote learning, um, enable parents and foster care agencies to access crucial education information available in online portals like New York City Schools account, or develop sensible protocols for students in care regarding, for example, uh, consenting to special education services via teletherapy during remote learning or opting into blended learning. While the task force's initial recommendation conceived of a team of DOE staff, we strongly believe there must be at least one senior staff member dedicated to students in foster care. Uh, this point person would have the expertise and capacity to work across city agencies and DOE divisions to develop and carry out policies, provide training, respond to questions, and execute plans to better support students in care. 
Um, and we'd like to work, work with the council in the coming year to ensure that at a minimum, the DOE designates one senior staff member to focus full time on this population that too often has been overlooked. Um, thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Erica, and um, I look, uh, look forward to working with you in the in the over the next year to, on on making that happen. I'm 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 here for not one more year, so uh, let's let's put that on the on the list of things we need to get done because uh, I think it's, it's you're right, it's very important. And if we can do that, um, if we can have a whole division for students in temporary housing, we can have um, you know somebody focus. I mean, on, in, a, in an agency that is uh, has a you know twenty five or thirty billion dollar budget. Um, they can dedicate somebody to, to make sure that youth in care are, are getting the services and, and resources they need. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks again, Erica. I'll now turn it over to Joyce McMillan. Time starts now. Um, good evening, everyone. Afternoon, Steve Levin and the rest of the council and everyone who put this hearing together. My name is Joyce McMillan. I am a parent impacted by the family regulation system. I was appointed to the foster care task force by Melissa Mark Viverito, who was city council speaker at the time. While the task force was born of good intentions, it failed to articulate, in fact, make the structural changes necessary to remove the harms that family and children entangled in the family regulation system experience. Directed and facilitated by ACS, most of the work done by the task force was characterized by problem solving that called for tweaks and small shifts to the system that requires seismic change and indeed scrapping in its entirety. ACS, the system that oppresses us, will never give us the key to set ourselves free. The audience today is listening to what ACS says. Parents and families experience what they do which is why at the end of the last hearing, when one of the parents from the PAC committee testified at the end of her testimony, she said, we must abolish ACS. This is a parent working with PAC on the inside who said this. In large part, the task force was comprised disproportionately of system folk, top brass at that. Top brass system folk are removed from the day-to-day -day struggles of workers who seek to support families with limited choices to do so. As systems are systemically and structurally racist and do not allow for anything other than dictatorship to families in certain communities, comprised mostly of people who live below the poverty line with little resources. It then boils down to communities being under surveillance and not supported. While the goal of improving outcomes for children aging out of the foster care is a noble one, the answer um, to the issue is simple. Instead of investing billions of dollars and building up ACS's infrastructure, utilize these funds to provide direct material resources needed to these youth. Permanent housing, food, internet, tablets, com computers, and stipends to provide the basic things people need on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, the city must invest its time, money, and attention into shifting the conditions that enmesh families in the family regulation system. Poverty, systemic and sustained divestment in Black and Latinx communities, neighborhoods, while white supremacy, ableism, and the like. We give foster agents who take children into their home, a generous monthly stipend to provide for children, even though many never spend any of the money on that child. Yet we provide no such support to parents desperately trying to keep their families intact. Indeed, the suggestion that we should provide the same type of financial assistance with parents is often viewed as preposterous. Based on the outcomes, there are no investments in the children placed in these out-of-home environments. How is this okay? Most families would never come under the surveillance of the family regulation system if they were given a stipend to assist with their needs. The system seems to show clear bias in who we support, how, and why. This same lack of trust that prevents making providing stipends to families seem preposterous or impossible also strongly influences and encourages partnerships 
between ACS and the community-based organizations, lacking trust in community visions of support and the will to fund such visions has led us to rely on ACS partnerships. But partnerships with ACS necessarily limits our ability to imagine and create a world in which ACS does not exist and puts a hold on all changes other than surface changes that appear to be a good idea, but has the devil hidden in the detail. Example, parent advocates and agencies. Communities can and should be trusted to care for and support themselves. Yet still, communities have not been provided with the opportunity and financial support to do so. Commissioner Hansel said, ACS did a survey to ask community if they wanted preventive services and the survey showed a positive support for preventive services. I would like to go a step further and ask how that question was asked or framed. Specifically, what options outside of ACS services, preventive services or otherwise were provided to those being surveyed? I can assure you, if asked, would you prefer an ACS investigation or a preventive worker, everyone would choose the latter. But if ACS asks, would you prefer preventive services or community supports that have no relationship whatsoever to ACS, I strongly believe most, if not all, would choose community supports. Over the decades, ACS puts a lot of time in changing their image without stepping back and changing their practices. ACS may have changed policies, but their practices on the ground look much and yet the same. A change in practice is not far track recently reintroduced as CARES. What CARES will do is subject families to interrogation ongoing and ACS intervention for months, force them into voluntary services they do not want in many cases need, all with the threat of switching the case to the investigation track if they don't comply. So people will take the less of the two evils. They will choose CARES. There will be no data collected to show how many people are being stopped and frisked by the child welfare system, as they like to call it, even though there's no welfare for the children. There is another component of data-driven decision-making that provides accountability, that lacks accountability, and is based on pre-existing contaminated prior interactions and outcomes. We must divest in ACS as well as other systems as their track records show. They cause more harm than good. Advocates should be separate from the policing system like ACS and the power dynamic will never allow them to authentically create better outcomes for families. I recently had a situation at an agency where the agency was very upset about my being present to support a parent at a visit. The parent asked me to attend the visit because she experienced many negative things during her visit that prevented her from bonding with her child. The agency pushed back very hard, but I prevailed and they knew the nonsense was, was going to stop. How can we expect a parent advocate working for that same agency to address these types of issues when the agency they are working for is causing parts of the harm? Overall, I think the minuscule improvements reported are not what we would have achieved had this task force been comprised of those who have been impacted by fa the family regulation system and true community-based grassroots organizations, not those on the ACS payroll that are in no way aligned with or working in partnership without ACS. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, and thank you for um, for all of the advocacy that you have done and continue to do and um, um, calling attention to the issues that need to be um, addressed and need to be examined over and over and over again. Um, and um, your commitment is, uh, is second to none. So. I want to thank you for um, for everything that you continue to do. I look forward to continuing work, working with you. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Thank you again, Joyce. I'm now going to call up our next panel. Our next panel will be in this order: John Centigar, Sarah Croon Childs, Jimmy Meager, and Jamel Robinson. And we will begin with John Centigar, followed by Sarah Croon Childs. Over to John. 
Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is John Centegar and I am the Director of Development and Communications at Covenant House New York. I would like to thank the Committee on General Welfare and Chairperson Stephen Levin for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding Intro 148. Covenant House New York is the city's largest nonprofit adolescent care agency serving youth experiencing homelessness ages 16 to 24. During this past year, CHNY served over 1,500 young people in our residential programs and through our drop-in center and street outreach efforts. On a nightly basis, we provide shelter to approximately 200 young people, including pregnant women and mothers with children, LGBTQ youth, and commercially sexually exploited youth and trafficking survivors. During COVID-19, our doors continue to remain open 24 seven, and we continue to ensure that youth in our care remain safe and healthy. Over four years ago, Mayor de Blasio recommended that, quote, eligibility criteria for the city's rental assistance program will be expanded to include youth living in RHY shelters at risk of entering DHS shelters, unquote. Since the mayor made this statement in April of 2016, youth in RHY shelters still do not have access to any city rental assistance programs. Time and again, our dedicated and experienced aftercare housing managers struggle to find housing options for young people who are about to leave our transitional housing programs, even when the client has met all of their individual and program goals. Ultimately, youth who have successfully completed our programs need access to affordable housing. A CityFAPS voucher would be an essential tool in making that happen. However, since our clients are receiving services from an RHY shelter instead of an HRA shelter, they're currently denied any opportunity to receive this voucher. It simply does not make sense that because a person is accessing services through a different agency, one that specializes in development and appropriate services for their age group, they should be denied a major pathway to housing stability. While youth in foster care remain an extremely vulnerable population, it is generally concerning that youth who are staying in our shelters are not given the same consideration. Advocates have been requesting that youth experiencing homelessness have access to these vouchers for over 10 years, and this has not come to fruition. The current bill presented today continues to exclude runaway and homeless youth populations. We're concerned that this distinction will pin foster care youth and those in the RHA population against each other, competing for limited resources and giving youth in foster care priority over youth who are staying in the shelter system. Ultimately, we believe this bill creates a precedent to continue to exclude RHY from other programs. We believe that both foster care youth and youth experiencing homelessness should be included in the at-risk and vulnerable population list. This agreement would allow both youth in foster care and those designated as RHY who are between 16 and 24 years old to access this vital resource without prioritizing one population over the other. We are aligned with the recommendations set forth earlier by Good Shepherd Services, as well as the Coalition for Homeless Youth in amending intro 148. And Mr. Levin, I wanna thank you specifically also for mentioning this earlier, and I hope you'll keep that under consideration. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm literally, I'm writing a text right now to the committee council saying, let's incorporate RHY, reconcile the bill with the CHY recs and pass it as quickly as possible. So <laughs> we're, I, I've, I've run out of, totally run out of patience on, on this issue. And, um, um, you know, when, when they did the city FEPS uh, rules a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I think I said, um, I'm giving you guys a year to make this work uh, with referrals from DYCD and ACS. And if that doesn't happen, we're moving forward on the bill. So I gave them a year. Um, I, you know, I kept my word and, you know, I'm, I'm done with that. And um, we have to move forward on the legislation. So I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing the recommendations, incorporating as many as we possibly can and, um, and, uh, and moving forward with the legislation as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. I'm now going to move on to Sarah Kroon Childs, followed by Jimmy Meager. Over to Sarah. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Childs. I'm the executive director of the Red Lake Horowitz Foundation, and we are a funder of the public private partnerships administered by the Foster Care Excellence Fund which has supported two task force priorities over the years, improving placements with kinship families through Home Away From Home and expanding education and career services to youth in care through Fair Futures. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues from the Conrad and Hilton Foundation, the New York Community Trust, 
Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Tiger Foundation, Stavros Narcos Foundation, the Ira DeCamp Foundation, and the Warner Fund for their commitment to supporting these child welfare initiatives over the years. I also want to express our gratitude to Chair Levin and Commissioner Hansel for their leadership and commitment to this important task force and follow on implementation. During the first ever New York City Council Foster Youth Shadow Day back in 2016, young people in and aged out of foster care called on the council and this administration to address the multitude of challenges facing children and families in child welfare and you and your colleagues answered that call. The result has been real change and improvements across the system rather than a task force report collecting dust on a shelf and the Foster Care Excellence Fund commends you for the hard work it took to get here. But there still is much work to be done. Our city has still has close to 700 young people aging out of foster care each year without supportive adults and the critical supports they need to have a fair shot at success. These young people aging out are 98% people of color and 34% LGBTQIA+. Reducing the harm this system has done to them is clearly a racial and social justice imperative for the city. We urge you to fulfill the promise of task force recommendation number 16 that sets an objective to provide comprehensive services to these young people to achieve educational career and housing goals. The city chose to remove these children from their families and never achieve permanency for them. It's our responsibility and duty to support them by expanding the proven Fair Futures model of coaching and other supports so that young people aging out of care between ages 21 and 26 can thrive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for uh, uh, all that you've done in partnership uh, with us at the council and, and um, um, you know, putting forward recommendations and legislative, um, you know, collaborating on, on legislative ideas. And uh, it's just been um, a, a great um, experience working with you in Red Lake Horowitz. And just want to thank you for, uh, for all that you've been doing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks again, Sarah. I'll now call on Jimmy Meager, followed by Jamel Robinson. Over to Jimmy, Jimmy Meager. Hi, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before the Committee on General Welfare today. My name is Jimmy Marr. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm policy director at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered, trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using a lens of racial equity to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in developing the public positions we hold. Safe Horizon has programs across New York City's five boroughs where we provide critical support and services to victims and survivors of all forms of violence and abuse. One program that is especially relevant to this conversation about housing justice for young people is our street work project. Streetwork works with homeless and street involved young people up to age 25 to help them find safety and stability. Many homeless young people face a day to day struggle to survive, which can lead to physical and emotional harm. Homeless youth may have experienced family abuse, violence, rejection and instability that led to their homelessness. We welcome these young folks, help them navigate complex systems and provide essential resources at our drop in centers at our overnight shelter and through our streetwork outreach teams. This work can be incredibly challenging, but also rewarding. Our work at Streetwork did not pause during this pandemic, rather our dedicated team continued to respond to homeless and at-risk young people in need of shelter, services, and understanding. Safe Horizon Streetwork Project has been doing this community-based work for decades. Young people experiencing homelessness need and deserve housing and economic justice. That is why we support the spirit of, of Intro 148, while also challenging the city to go even further. It is a noble and common sense idea to count time in foster care as homelessness when determining such youth's eligibility for rental assistance programs. We support this and additional efforts to make permanent, safe, and affordable housing accessible to young people experiencing homelessness and unstable housing. However, this particular bill will affect a relatively small percentage of Streetworks clients. 
Intro 148 will have no effect on runaway and homeless youth, DYCD clients, and young people in DYCD shelters who have had no contact with child welfare or with the foster care system. Our clients are not eligible for vouchers, and time spent in homeless youth programs such as shelters does not count. We therefore encourage the City Council to build on this legislation, think bigger, and go further. We encourage the city to also count time in youth shelters as homeless time, and we ask that the city give homeless youth programs like Streetwork and others the ability to distribute vouchers. The young people currently or formerly in foster care face many of the same obstacles as RHY, but there's actually a small overlap between these two populations. Frequently, when we advocate for housing resources for RHY, the policy solutions we hear from our government leaders are resources only for former foster youth, which again is important, but not expansive enough. Most RHY are not eligible for those resources. Many of our clients have never had any prior contact with child welfare and subsequently the foster care system. Even among our clients who have had contact with the child welfare system, almost none of them are eligible for housing resources because of it. Um, while people are advocating for increased value of vouchers, um, we're just asking for equal access. I'm inspired. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Um, happy to take any questions. Um, Jimmy, you could, uh, if you had any further comments, you can finish your testimony. <laughs> Um, we'll just we'll submit written testimony, but thank you so much. And of course, thank you for all the, uh, the great work that Safe Horizon does. And, and um, you know, as I said um, to John before, we're you know we're eager to incorporate um, the youth in RHY um, shelters and and make sure that uh, that this bill is not um, you know servicing one group of kids at the young people at the expense of the, uh, the other, so. Exactly, we agree wholeheartedly yeah. with Elizabeth and with John. We don't want anybody falling between the cracks. And we just hate any time that people who are vulnerable experiencing homelessness are being pit against yeah. one another for, for um, skin resources. Agreed, agreed. So thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. Th thank you, Jimmy. And I apologize for not pronouncing your name correctly. I'll do better next time. Next up will be Jamel Robinson as the last panelist for this panel. And Jamel, before you begin, I, I you know, I, I don't think I recognized you last time because your 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 full beard <laughs> makes you look so much older uh, <laughs> than than you you know before with the spot with the mustache. So I didn't recognize you at your last testimony, but nice to see you. Always great to see you. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. Uh, I want to take a moment of personal privilege, if I could. I want to thank the committee uh, for uh, this assembly. I want to uh, take this opportunity, if I could. I want to, um, it, I have a little bias, okay? It's not racial bias, but it's bias, nonetheless. Um, Erica Palmer is on, on this line. Um, Erica was my staff attorney some years ago, some time uh, 10 some odd years ago when I was uh, in the foster care system, you know, um, for uh, taking a moment of uh, personal privilege, I could not be uh, more grateful uh, to see her still engrafted in this work. And um, oh God, I didn't even have a GD at that time. Uh, I was six months shy of my 21st birthday uh, when I launched the Jamel Robinson Child Welfare Reform Initiative, which was a list of several recommendations, uh, Chair Levin, as you know, which um, with identifying uh, challenges that uh, uh, beset youth in foster care. And um, I, I took the JD twice at that time and failed um, after uh, um, a, a short stint um, of homelessness. And Erica Palmer was there every step of the way. I cannot begin to tell you, uh, uh, Chair Levin, um, uh, how uh, instrumental she has been in my life, both personally and professionally. Today, I can be honest to say that uh, I didn't know years ago that I would be quite where I am, but it is uh, that uh, sort of mentorship, that love and that affinity uh, that sees young people and the investments in them um, as, 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 as potential. Today, I could, I, I'm proud to say that uh, I went back to college because of Erica. Um, in addition to other mentors like Jess and Jeremy. Um, and uh, I went back to college. Um, I mean, I went back to uh, acquire a GED, uh, went on, uh, got uh, a bachelor's in community and human services, went on and pursued a master's in uh, nonprofit leadership. I went, returned back to school. Um, and um, this coming semester, I will complete with a Master of Science in Social and Public Policy and a, a graduate certificate in social entrepreneurship. And I want to say, Erica, 
uh, it is that type of mentorship, it is that type of courage, it is that type of conviction, but it was not popular that helped me get to where I am and I want to thank you. So in the context of that, uh, Chair Levin, when you talk about fair futures, when you talk about access to opportunity, when you talk about reconciling this, uh, this, uh, this stain of racial uh this this racial biasness um, yeah, uh, that we that we see uh racial disproportionality that we see in the child welfare system when you talk about recompense and you hear people talk about reparations and it seems so far off you say well how how could we talk about reparations how how could we how do we repay people for uh taking them away from the families and how could we what can i tell you can i tell you one area fear futures before we ask uh for individuals like Sarah to provide the um, foundations to provide assistance for youth in foster care. Before we ask, before we ask other uh, foundations to come up and fit the bill, we have to make sure that ACS uh, puts in their share first. They should be the first partakers. These are their children, and an extension of that work trickles down to the foundations and and and, and the corporate sector. But Chair Levin, we have to, I, 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 I could appreciate Julie Farber's comments earlier, but I got to commission, I got to, I got to push back, uh, Chair Levin, I got to challenge you to see this a different way. Hear me, we're talking about emotional wellness outcomes for youth in foster care. Chair Levin, hear me, hear me. This is over 30 some odd years from, from, from policy report to policy report all across this country that says that we have been at epidemic proportions with regard to mental health and emotional well-being. Recommendation after recommendation, uh, uh, Chair Levin, that we have not revisited and to say, what, what have we not done? And Chair, I'm stopping here, but I, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, and, I, and this is why I, I, I'm, 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 I'm convicted, because I allowed last, last hearing, I allowed them to get away, and I, I should have said, Chair, for brevity, let me stop referring to my notes, but I should have said to you, Chair, that no, 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 this is long overdue. And when we talk about racial disparities, sir, can I tell you, mental health disparities is the number one. And across nationally, we have young people up to 80% suffer from a significant mental health issue. It doesn't mean that they're crazy, it just means that they need additional support. It doesn't mean that they, it doesn't mean that we, and we don't need, hear me, and I'm, I conclude here, we don't need the state to tell us that we are in crisis, Chair, uh, Chair Levin. We don't need to tell, we don't need the state to come give us the data to, for us to look at the numbers across the nation to realize that we are in peril. What we could do is we could take incremental steps, but we need to start now. There is no policies con with regard to older youth uh, uh, transition uh, um, with respect to emotional wellness outcomes. There is not. I, I, I submitted, I, and, and, and I, can, I really conclude here, I, and I submitted, I, I, uh, I requested from ACS a, 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 a set of questions for a policy report that I will release in the coming weeks um, regard to mental health and emotional well-being. And they, and they responded back to me. And I can tell you with a surety that there is no, there is no uh, uh, policies with regard to older uh, uh, young people uh, um, experiencing mental health challenges. I'm going to ask you to do three things, Commissioner Chair. I'm going to uh, uh, Chair Levin, and this is not just particularly for here, for, for here and now. I'm asking you, please, uh, uh, um, convene a hearing on the on the mental health and emotional well-being outcomes of youth in foster care. We could do it early. We could do it. We need to figure out where they are. We need to figure out how we can best support, get support around them. That's one. I also will ask that you also add, uh, uh, make it a mandate that ACS go ahead and do an emotional wellness survey specific to our emotional wellness um, needs of youth in foster care. Uh, it, it, I know it's a part of the other survey, but it needs to be specific. And I think, it, and they should be, and they should report and uh, have an annual report, uh, policy report. They should submit uh, with regard to recommendations.
an emotional wellness outcome for youth in foster care. I'm going to stop there because I do realize that my time has been far expended and I, I have gone all, all over the place, but I would be remiss if I did not say to you, uh, Chair Levin, we have to be very, we have to be very deliberate about this because the, the new and, and the, the challenge that we're going to face after this pandemic is going to be around emotional wellness. I Can I tell you, Chair, I, 10 years after leaving foster care, the 10, 12 years after leaving foster care, I'm 32 now. I mean, 33 now. Let me tell you, you told me to go to school. I went to school. You told me to get housing. I got housing. You told me to do all of this. It just still doesn't, it just still doesn't. I still get sad. I still deal with depression. I still deal with anxiety and all the trauma that I've I have gone through for, for you know experiencing homelessness, uh, retreat, and all those other experiences. They're still there after you told me to do all the things that you asked me to do. So I am asking you, if not for nothing else, if not for nothing else, you have done a great job, Chair Levin, and I'm really directing it toward you because you can move the needle on this. I'm asking you to think very, very strategically about where we go from here with regard to emotional well-being. When we when we talk about uh, fair futures, I want you to be very deliberate about making sure that we understand it is mentorship like Erica Palmer that made that ex accessible when it was not popular in the sense that it was no program, but it was that that type of fidelity to, to the issues that matter to us most. And that is our uh, 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 well-being. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamel. I, I think Chair Levin. Oh, th yeah, thank you, Jamel. Uh, thank you for um, well, congratulations, first off, on on um, on uh, your mat. You're working on your towards your master's. Um, um, that's very that's very exciting, and um, and thank you for your testimony. Um, uh, thank you for for centering uh, this conversation in a way um, that uh, uh, that it wasn't before, and and um, and so so nice to be able to on my Zoom screen. You're right next to Erica. Um, your two your two screens, and so that was very um, uh, heartening to uh, to hear that. I didn't know that. Um, that story, but it was nice to it was nice to uh, for you to express that um, and for for all of us to know. So, and uh, again, it's nice to see you and um, exactly. and thank you for the for, for your. But are you going to um, address my? You're going to address? Yes, yes, oh, yes, okay. yes, yes. I'll okay, address, I want to yes. be very clear that we because I think that yes. that's what happened before. We didn't get to kind of. I, I really want to make sure that. We yes. Kind of, okay. Yes. Yes. And let's and let's keep talking. Um, let's okay. keep talking after the hearing. Gotcha. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see. Um, uh, I think uh, Joyce wanted to add something as well. Is that correct, Joyce? Do you have your hand raised? I do. I just want to say thank you for your moving and compelling testimony, Mr. Robinson. And I would love to be in touch with you. And Mr. Levin, I just want to say this is what I speak about when I say. We sit here today listening to what ACS is telling us, but we yeah. have to hear from the people who have experienced this because I'm sure Mr. Robinson didn't come into care with these many issues. I believe many of them happened in care and he's nodding his head yes. And with that being said, we gotta stop removing children under the guise of protecting them and causing these type of outcomes, receiving more monies at the foster care home because the child is deemed now to have a mental health issue that they cause. Then we sit here today and talk about all of the things that they're correcting without ever speaking about the fact that they caused it. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, okay, does anyone else wish to testify? If anyone else does, if we inadvertently missed anyone who wishes to testify at this time, you can use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you at this time if we've missed you. Okay, seeing none, I want to thank everybody for your testimony today. Um, uh, we all have 
a lot of work left to do. And, you know, certainly you have my commitment that um, I will be um, here with you all until, you know, my last, my last day as chair um, to try to get as much done as possible. And, and I want to thank again, everybody for your amazing dedication. Um, with that at 1.43 PM, this hearing is adjourned.